Back in 2015, I joined my husband, who was in the Navy at the time, in Japan. I was so excited. Having been an Air Force kid and spending a few years in Japan previously, and even more so when I was told that we were living in town rather than on base housing. Our little house was an older style, but still fairly modern by Japanese standards, with the living and dining room, toilet, and washroom downstairs, and the entire upstairs being our bedroom. We lived right by the local marina, walking distance from an aquarium and a grocery store, and I was immediately in love. When I arrived, a small apartment complex was being built next door, and I got used to the sounds of work going on throughout the day, as the walls of the house and the windows were fairly thin. But I was never bothered by the noises, since I spent most of the daylight hours exploring and enjoying the surrounding area, and before I knew it, construction was done. That's when I started noticing the footsteps. At first, I had assumed that the footsteps I was hearing were just the construction workers, until I remembered the building was done, and one day, I finally realized that the footsteps I was hearing was out of bare feet. If you've ever lived in a place with wood floors, you know that there's a distinct sound when you walk on it barefoot versus wearing shoes. Even though the walls of the house were thin, I thought that I couldn't possibly be hearing any of my neighbors, but initially I gave it little thought. Then, one day, I was leaving the kitchen to go upstairs, and as I was approaching the hall, looking directly at the restroom, I paused when I thought I saw a stack of toilet paper, which I kept stacked on the windowsill, move. The window was closed, yet I saw the roll on the top of the little tower, as clear as day, nudge forward and fall to the floor, followed by the sound of faint footsteps. A little bit freaked out, I told my husband about it when he got home, joking that maybe we had a ghost. My husband then told me that he had witnessed something similar with a hiking stick that he kept by the front door. He'd been tying his shoes and had looked up in time to watch the stick slowly tip forward before it fell, and he admitted that he had occasionally heard the footsteps too. Now, I've never considered myself religious by any means, but I was raised with a healthy respect for the dead and the possibility of spirits, so I looked into Japanese remedies to deal with potential ghosts. Since I didn't feel unsafe or necessarily uneasy in the house, I didn't think it was necessary to ask the local shrine for a blessing, and with the help of a more experienced bilingual friend, took the advice of one of the shrine maidens to hang a wind chime on the property. I picked one up from the 100 yen store, Japan's equivalent to America's Dollar General or something similar, and sure enough, I stopped hearing the footsteps, and nothing fell unexpectedly after I hung it. I figured even if it was just a comforting placebo effect, I'd picked a cute chime and it made a pretty cool sound, so I was happy regardless. Several months passed and the string on the chime had weathered until I eventually found that it had fallen and, being made of glass, had shattered. I told myself that I would grab another one while I was out in town, but it repeatedly slipped my mind as my little brother was coming for a visit in a few weeks and I was wrapped up in my excitement and planning activities for his visit. One day, while we were showing him around town, my husband pointed out the wind chime display and jokingly reminded me to get one for our resident ghost. Immediately, and in dull seriousness, my brother shouted, I knew your place was haunted. He'd said this with a slight bit of humor, like an aha moment, but he was still pretty serious and I was surprised because my husband and I were the only ones who knew about our odd experiences. Also, while I knew my brother was similarly skeptical of things, I'd always been the more superstitious one. Curious, I asked him why he thought the house was haunted. Well, my brother replied, I was up late watching YouTube on my phone. 
with one headphone in, and I heard footsteps behind me. But when I turned around, I didn't see anybody there. I know I heard someone walking in the hallway, but I've seen the grudge and I knew better than to be that white guy, so I just went back to my phone. But I definitely heard footsteps. Since my husband and I had never considered the ghost in the house to be malicious or angry, we all got a good laugh out of my brother's animated retelling of his night and agreed to grab a new wind chime. My brother picked one out and hung it specifically on the wall by his futon for extra luck during his stay, and he confirmed that nearly every morning for the rest of his stay that he hadn't heard anything during the night. Before we left Japan, I made sure to take down the chime so that the movers wouldn't pack it. I hung it in the little corner garden on the property and made a last trip to the local shrine with a friend to help me thank the shrine maiden who had suggested it to me. I hoped that whoever moved in after us kept the garden and the ghost didn't feel disrespected during our stay because I truly loved the house and my experiences there. The Watcher of Red River Gorge by Armana O. My encounter in the dense shadowed woods of Red River Gorge in Kentucky was a chilling experience that still lingers in my memory. Known for its breathtaking natural beauty, Red River Gorge is also steeped in local folklore with tales of mysterious creatures and unexplained phenomena. I was on a weekend camping trip seeking solitude in nature's embrace. The gorge, with its towering cliffs and winding rivers, seemed the perfect escape. On my second night, as I sat by the campfire, the forest around me was alive with the sounds of nocturnal creatures. It was well past midnight when I first heard it, a soft rhythmic tapping, like someone knocking on wood. I assumed it was a woodpecker or some other animal, but the sound was persistent, growing louder, closer. Curiosity peaked, I grabbed my flashlight and ventured into the woods. The tapping led me deeper into the forest, away from the safety of my campsite. The dense canopy above swallowed the moonlight, casting eerie shadows across my path. As I walked, I felt a growing sense of unease the feeling of being watched from the darkness. Then I saw it, standing between two trees, partially obscured by shadows, was a figure. It was tall and humanoid, but unnaturally thin, its limbs elongated, and its head slightly cocked to one side, as if examining me. Its eyes, if it had any, were hidden in the darkness. Frozen in place, I felt a primal fear take hold. The figure remained motionless, just watching. The woods were silent now, the earlier chorus of nocturnal sounds eerily absent. The air grew colder, and a mist began to rise from the ground, enveloping the figure until it was barely visible. I don't know how long I stood there, locked in this silent standoff, but eventually, I mustered the courage to move. As I slowly backed away, the figure remained still, its presence looming in the mist. When I reached my campsite, the fire had died down to embers, casting a faint, dying glow over the area. My tent seemed like a fragile shield against the vast, unknowable wilderness that surrounded me. I spent the rest of the night awake, my senses heightened to every rustle and whisper of the woods. I half expected to see that figure emerge from the shadows, but the woods remained silent, as if holding its breath. The normal nocturnal sounds didn't return. There was no chirping of crickets or hooting of owls, just a suffocating stillness that enveloped the campsite. Every snap of a twig or shift of the wind sent a jolt of adrenaline through me. As dawn broke, bringing light and a semblance of normalcy back to the forest, 
I felt a profound sense of relief, but also of deep unsettlement, knowing that the serenity of the day masks the mysteries that come alive under the cover of night. After I had gotten back from my trip, I learned about the legend of the Watcher, a spirit said to guard the forest. It was believed to appear to those who ventured too deep into the woods, a reminder to respect the wilderness. Whatever it was I encountered at Red River Gorge, I haven't been back since, and I'm not sure if or when I ever will go back again. I just can't get that creature out of my head. A Chilling Encounter in the Woods of Maine by Tamara. I live in Maine, and for those who don't know, the woods here can be pretty dense and expansive. I've always been an avid hiker, often going on trails deep into the forest. Last Saturday, I decided to take a new trail. It was in a more secluded part of the woods, and I was excited to explore it. About two hours into the hike, I started feeling this odd sensation, like I was being watched. I stopped, listened, but only heard the usual sounds of the forest. Shrugging it off, I continued. But that feeling just grew stronger, and then things started getting weird. I noticed a strange mist forming around me, which was odd because the day was clear. The temperature dropped suddenly, and the forest became eerily silent. No birds, no wind, just silence. And that's when I saw it. About 30 feet away from me, partially obscured by the mist, there was a figure. It was hard to make out clearly, but it seemed to flicker in and out of existence. It wasn't moving. It was just standing there, watching me. I was frozen in place, not sure if I was seeing things or if it was real. After what felt like an eternity, I mustered up the courage to move, and as soon as I took a step, the figure vanished, and the mist started to dissipate. The normal sounds of the forest slowly returned, and so did the normal temperature. I rushed back to the trailhead, constantly looking over my shoulder. I have never experienced anything like this before. I know Maine has its share of folklore and ghost stories, but I've always been a skeptic. Now I'm not so sure. Has anyone else experienced something like this in Maine or anywhere else? I'm trying to make sense of what I saw and felt. Any insights or similar experiences would be greatly appreciated. The Louisville Mansion. My encounter in an old mansion in Louisville, Kentucky, is something that I still can't fully explain. I had moved to Louisville for work and heard stories about the city's historic district being home to some of the most haunted places in the state. The mansion in question, a Victorian era building, was known for its eerie past and supposed paranormal activity. I got the chance to visit the mansion during the local heritage event. The house was impressive, with its gothic architecture and antique furnishings. During the tour, our guide shared stories of the original owners and various reports of ghost sightings, including the apparition of a woman in a Victorian dress seen wandering the halls. As the tour proceeded, I lagged behind taking in the details of the house. When we reached the upper floors, I felt a sudden drop in temperature. It was a warm day, and the house didn't have air conditioning, so this sudden chill was unexpected. In one of the bedrooms, I stopped to look at an old portrait. That's when I heard a soft whisper, almost like a sigh, right next to my ear. I turned around quickly, but no one was there. The rest of the group was in the next room, and I was alone. 
Feeling unnerved, I hurried to catch up with the others. As the tour ended and we were about to leave, I decided to use the restroom on the first floor. Walking down the hall, I saw a figure out of the corner of my eye. It was a woman, dressed in a long flowing gown, similar to the Victorian style our guide had mentioned. I assumed she was part of the staff or an actor hired for the event. She didn't look like a ghost. She looked fully fleshed out, just like anyone else. I called out to her, asking if I could ask her about the history of the house, but she didn't respond. She simply walked toward the end of the hall and then vanished. I rushed to see where she had disappeared, but there was no one there and there was no exit she could have taken. It was literally a dead end, no pun intended. I left the mansion in a complete state of disbelief. I couldn't shake the feeling that what I had experienced was something far out of the ordinary. Waverly Hills Sanatorium by Katie R. My paranormal encounter at Waverly Hills Sanatorium in Kentucky, a place infamous for its haunted history and unsettling past, still haunts my thoughts. Located on a hilltop in Kentucky, Waverly Hills served as a tuberculosis hospital in the early 20th century, where thousands unfortunately succumbed to the disease. The stories of hauntings and unexplained phenomena drew me there. I had a mix of curiosity and skepticism going in. As I joined a guided night tour of the sanatorium, the imposing gothic structure loomed against the sky, its broken windows like dark, watchful eyes. The guide began recounting the sanatorium's history, the suffering of its patients, and the numerous reports of ghostly sightings. We made our way through the dilapidated halls, the air heavy with the weight of untold stories. The most unsettling part of the tour was the visit to the infamous Death Tunnel, a long downhill passageway used to discreetly remove the bodies of patients who had died. As we descended into the tunnel, a palpable sense of dread filled the air. The tunnel was cold, damp, and pitch black, save for the beams of our flashlights. We were halfway down when I heard it, the sound of faint, echoing footsteps coming from the darkness behind us. I turned, shining my light down the tunnel, but there was nothing there. Feeling unnerved, we continued, but the footsteps persisted, keeping pace with us. Then, suddenly, they stopped. In the silence that followed, a chilling whisper brushed past my ear unintelligible but unmistakably human. I spun around, but again, there was nothing but the oppressive darkness of the tunnel. As we emerged from the tunnel, the sense of unease stayed with me. The rest of the tour was marked by minor unexplained occurrences, doors creaking open on their own, sudden drops in temperature, the feeling of being watched, that kind of thing. The climax of the experience came when we visited one of the old patient wards. As we stood there in the dark, abandoned room, a gust of wind swept through out of nowhere, despite all the windows being sealed. Then, the beam of my flashlight caught the fleeting image of a figure, dressed in what appeared to be a hospital gown, moving across the room before disappearing into thin air. More than one of us saw this, the encounter at Waverly Hills Sanatorium was more than just a ghost tour. It was a brush with something unexplainable, a peek into what lies beyond. And honestly, I came out a believer. In what in particular, I'm not entirely sure. But there's something after this world.
Back in 2013, I was teaching English in Shukugawa, Hyogo, Japan for a year. It was truly a dream come true. Well, my English center's latest class got out at about 10.30, and with it being Japan, I felt completely safe walking home along the Shukugawa River so late at night. Along my walk, I had to pass under the JR Kobe line and would pass a small Buddhist temple as I came out from under the bridge. Now, I had done this walk dozens of times by now, and nothing scary, let alone mildly unnerving, had ever happened. It was late March, so the weather was cool and comfortable. However, I noticed that as I drew closer to the temple, it got cooler. Cool enough for me to zip up my hoodie and shiver. As I was coming up the path, I heard the distinct sound of someone praying at the altar. The small gong or bell was rung, a five yen coin clattered at the altar box, and two claps to announce the prayer's presence to the gods were heard. I stopped for a brief second, thinking it was weird that somebody was out so late to say a prayer, but I shrugged it off and moved on. Turning the corner, I expected to see somebody at the altar, but it was empty. I froze. There was absolutely no way that somebody could have prayed that fast and bolted off without me hearing them along the gravel path. It was then that I noticed how still the night was. No bugs or birds, no sounds of the city, and the river to my left sounded muted. The feeling of being watched and unwelcomed washed over me. Slowly, I began to move, the temple now to my back. I took just a few steps before I heard the bell, the coin, and the two claps. Fear gripped me. I broke out into a cold sweat as the shadows of the trees seemed to grow dark and deep. I gathered my nerves and anxiously turned to face the temple. Nothing but a vacant temple. Slowly I turned and started walking again, and then... I heard two claps, clear as day, right in my left ear. Needless to say, I bolted the rest of the way home. After that night, I avoided passing by that temple whenever I worked the later classes and opted to just take the long way home. My story goes back to September 2019, when I visited my girlfriend who lives in Japan. We decided to go to Shizuoka Prefecture, in the countryside, in a hotel that looked like a ryokan. We couldn't have a big bed, so we had to sleep in two single beds. My girlfriend heard a sound like a whisper coming from the bathroom and started to feel anxious about it, but didn't tell me for fear of scaring me. We fall asleep in each single bed after a really long day of bicycling in the surrounding mountains. I wake up at 2 o'clock in the morning in full sleep paralysis state. It's not my first time, so I know what I have to do. Calm down and try to wake myself up by talking, or at least trying. For people familiar to sleep paralysis, you often feel looked at by a shadow and its presence slowly creeps up on you. My girlfriend, who was already anxious, woke up to see me blabbering some sound and making a scary face as I struggled to speak. She freaked out so much and it took at least a minute before I managed to wake myself up. So I asked her why she didn't try to wake me up. She said that the sound she heard made her so scared that she thought a spirit had possessed me and was trying to reach out to her. I told her where the shadow I saw in my dream came from, and she told me that the sound she'd heard earlier came from the same place. We were so convinced it was an actual spirit in the room that we couldn't fall back asleep before sunrise, and we had to share a single bed for the rest of the night. I try to rationalize it and think that the sound came from another room, but no clients were staying close to us. 
and that she freaked out because I was having sleep paralysis and it's normal to see a shadow when that happens. But something really mysterious happened in that hotel, and we will definitely remember that experience. In 2012, I found myself stationed in North Kandahar, standing guard one night just shy of midnight. My attention was drawn to some unexpected movement in a nearby rubbish heap. Initially, it seemed to be just a dog rummaging around, but to my astonishment, it rose on its hind legs and walked away nonchalantly in a disturbingly human manner. Fear gripped me. Upon inquiring from the local villagers, we were told that it was a yeti, part of a family that had resided in a nearby cave. They ominously shared how these creatures occasionally kidnapped and ate villagers. The chill that ran down my spine at this translation was palpable, and it was clear I wasn't the only one affected. This spectacle was witnessed by everyone in our combat outpost, or COP and it earned the humorous moniker, Man Bear Pig. Although we all laughed it off, when the opportunity arose to track the creature, no volunteers stepped forward. One midnight, as I was about to drift off to sleep on my cot, the crackle of gunfire from the Afghan army side of the camp startled me awake. Accompanied by the master sergeant, we quickly armed ourselves and went to investigate the commotion. The Afghani soldiers explained they had spotted the Yeti and opened fire, but it had managed to escape. The master sergeant turned to me and proposed, with a jovial glint in his eye, You want to rally the troops and hunt this creature down? We could become famous. I simply shook my head in silent refusal. We shared a chuckle and retreated back to our cots leaving the Yeti to its nightly escapades. I am a carer and I have been for about five or six years. I prefer to work nights as it's a calmer working experience. I've seen and heard many strange things, but two stick out, and I thought I'd tell you about it. The first one. I was on shift one night, and every hour we have to do checks on the residents to make sure that they're okay and still with us. So I'm doing my checks, and everything is going okay, until I get to the last room. This lady likes her door closed at night, so the light in the corridor doesn't wake her up and I go to open her door, but I couldn't move it. It was as if someone was pushing it shut from the other side. I tried two or three times to open it, and it just won't budge. Fearing that the lady has fallen behind it, I go to get the nurse on shift and my colleagues. Each of us try to open the door, but it won't move. After 20 minutes or so, the door opens easily, as it should do, and the lady was asleep in bed snoring away, and there's nothing there to have kept the door closed. I should mention that this was in a part of the building that no one likes to be alone in, as it always feels like you're being watched. On a couple of occasions, a shadow has been seen in some of the rooms. The second. I came in on shift and found out that one of the residents had passed away just 30 minutes before the night staff got there. We were waiting for the undertakers to come and collect the body. It could be up to two hours before they got there. As we were going about our job, the buzzer went off in that room. I went and switched it off and left the room. His buzzer went off every 10 minutes until the undertakers arrived, and none of us could ever explain why or how it was doing that.
This story happened three years ago when I was 15. It happened in my village. I don't tell this story much because people tend to think that I'm making it up, but I've been thinking of it quite a lot this week and I just wanted to share it. My village is located in a rural area that is protected by the government because it has been considered a natural paradise for the last 30 years. This means that exploration in this area is quite difficult nowadays since it is forbidden to cut trees, which means that it is a huge forest. I was spending my summer there and my favorite thing was to go hiking, although I had never gone into the woods alone, just on roads with people. My grandma had told me the cleaning services had opened and rehabilitated a path that had been covered in bushes and trees for the last 30 years because of a race that was being prepared, like runners and stuff. Usually I'd go to the nearest town about an hour away on foot by the only way that I knew, the road. On my way back from seeing friends there, I took the new path that my granny told me was safe. I went alone. That was a mistake. The first part of the path was the easiest, just too many obstacles and landslides, but it was nothing compared to the rest. The second part was a hill full of rocks that was the hardest thing to go up. Literally, I had to climb up on my arms and legs like a dog. When I got to the top, I looked around and found some animal bones. I didn't pay much attention to it since the area is known for its big population of wolves and bears that go out at night. I continued my way faster than before. This part was plain floor, where the woods really begin, so it was a relief when I got to a dead end. Some huge trees had fallen exactly on a row on the path, and it was impossible to cross them. This seemed really off to me, because there were no other fallen trees. The weirdest part? Beside those trees, there was this little barn. Yes, a barn in the middle of the woods, I thought to myself that it was probably abandoned. It looked like it. So I decided to throw my bag into the little field that belonged to the barn, and I crossed the fence. I crossed it running without realizing the most bizarre thing. The field had no trees. It was clear. No bushes, no big plants, nothing. It really shouldn't be like that if it was abandoned, and nobody had been able to cut anything down there for years. I started feeling concerned about how the location of the fallen trees was so coincidental, how there casually was this barn beside a clear field when the path had been closed for 30 years. It just seemed really off. I went on and luckily I was reaching the last hill that my grandma had described, the one that connected with the village. Suddenly there was a moment of silence in the woods absolute silence, which allowed me to hear some branches cracking behind me. I thought to myself it was probably a bird or something, but they came closer and they sounded like footsteps. After trying to convince myself it was probably just an animal, I was way too afraid to look back. I started walking faster and guess what? So did the footsteps. I just took off running after I noticed that, and so did the footsteps. At this point, I was running for my life. Suddenly, I started to hear incredibly loud grunts. Everything was going really fast. Luckily, I got to my village in a minute or so after that. I got onto the patio of the first house I found and closed the door. It was a relative's house, no need to call the police. I stayed there for 10 minutes until I got my breath back and then I went home. I get chills just from remembering the place, not having a signal in the middle of nowhere. And the grunts. It makes me think there was something following me since the barn and the trees were just a distraction to slow me down. I never went into the woods alone after that. A year ago, while living in New Jersey, I currently live in Michigan, I came across a strange news story 
about a young hiker discovered dead in a mountainous forest. It initially seemed a routine incident, but the circumstances soon proved to be strange. The report indicated that the mountain was undergoing a period of heavy rainfall during that time. The downpour was relentless, sometimes exceeding half an inch per hour, and it continued for several days before and during the search for the man. An autopsy conducted by a medical examiner revealed intriguing findings. Aside from a few scratches on his knees, the man displayed no visible injuries or signs of infection. However, the condition of his lungs and airways was alarming. The autopsy report emphasized the remarkable presence of pus in his tracheal bronchial tree. The man was only 28 years old. What's even stranger is that the coroner suggested the rainfall might have contributed to his condition. By the time the hiker was found, he had been dead for three days and there was no record of him issuing any distress calls. It also hinted that hypothermia was not the cause of death. After this report, there were no subsequent updates about the man's case. It was a startling silence for such an unusual incident. A man found lifeless on a mountain, his lungs and airways filled with an abnormal amount of fluid. Sometimes, I still wonder about what really happened to him. So, I live in a small town in the southwest of Scotland. One of those towns where if you don't know someone, you will definitely know one of their friends. In 2015, I moved into a flat or apartment with my two children and my partner. The flat seemed nice and it was in a quiet part of town. Needless to say, we were all really happy with the move. At the time, my eldest son Bobby was four and my youngest Derek was three. Soon after moving in, I started noticing strange things happening. For example, the washing machine turned itself on and off at the wall doors opened on their own. But the strangest incidents were yet to come. One night, when the kids were in bed, about six months after moving in, Bobby came running to the living room and said, Daddy, please could you come and tell the hand in my room to stop trying to play with my teddy bears? So naturally, I went into his room and told this what I thought was imaginary hand off. About two weeks later, my son Bobby came to me again. With the complete matter-of-fact innocence of a child, he goes, Daddy, did you know there's a ghost in your attic? I didn't think much of it. Kids will be kids. The next day, I was at work, talking to a colleague about where we'd moved to. Out of nowhere, he goes, Hey, did you know that back in April of 2014, some young guy hung himself in your flat? Suddenly, Bobby talking about a ghost in the attic started to feel a lot more concerning. What blows my mind is that Bobby had never talked about ghosts before moving here. At the time, he didn't even know what an attic or a loft was. I did some digging and even spoke to a friend who's a local police officer. I asked him about the whole incident with the young guy, and he goes, Oh yeah, that's true. He hung himself in the attic up there. We still live in that house, and to this day, strange things happen from time to time. Most recently, the TV turned itself on and turned the volume up to full blast, all on its own. I was the only one home at the time. What's really strange is that my youngest son Derek has never mentioned anything ghostly. It's all very strange, but very real. I grew up in a small California desert tourist town called Joshua Tree, home of the Joshua Tree National Park. Those of us that are older call it the Monument, as it was that before it was National Parkdom. I was in my early 20s at the time, which was approximately 15 to 16 years ago. 
and I was the only one with a car and a license. Growing up in a small desert town leaves you with limited options for fun, and we would always make use of the park. Occasionally, maybe once a week or so, a group of us would pile into the station wagon with beer, smokes, and a mixtape, and drive through the park late at night. An empty road, so dark and quiet, other than the loud group of guys in a red Mercury driving fast from one entrance to the other, was just the kind of vibe we liked. Hours would go by each time as we drove along the desolate road and stopped at various rocks that we liked to climb on. I cannot overstate how desolate it was, how alone we felt. No other cars, no other lights, except the occasional lonely unmanned road work sign when warranted. That's exactly what we thought it was at first, but I'm getting ahead of myself. This trip started like every other, except maybe more of us than usual. Crammed in that car, windows down as I chain smoked and drove a good 20 miles an hour over the speed limit, gravel was spitting up as we were driving along having a great time. Shortly into the trip, I saw a light. A blue light. Possibly. It was miles and miles ahead. But that's the thing about the dark. Dark like you get out in the desert. The light can shine for miles. I remember saying something about having to slow down at some point ahead. Must be some kind of construction sign left up, I thought. Had to be a sign. The light hadn't moved. We continued for a few miles to one of our favorite stops and got out. We climbed for a while, maybe 45 minutes or so. We drank a little, we joked a lot, the norm. Then we piled back in and continued. To be very clear, this light never moved and we'd already been about an hour into our adventure. A question that I kept thinking though was, why would a sign have a blue light? It's very unusual. But we still figured it was a sign because it was so stationary. As we approached the light, I started to slow down. I slowed more and more as we approached the source. It wasn't a sign. It wasn't a car. It wasn't even a UFO. Standing on the side of the road, facing toward us, unmoving for over an hour at this point, was a man. A pale white man with a white beard, dirty old miner clothing, and an old mining helmet. He was holding a pickaxe, period appropriate for a time long before the park was anything other than desert with some lonely mines. His light was giving off this unnatural and bright blue light, his face was blank, but he stared at us, directly at all of us. We sped up, and as we drove by faster, his head turned to keep pace with us as we left. His light was visible, unmoving once again, facing us the entire trip out. It never flickered. It never moved. He wasn't translucent. But the saying, as white as a ghost, applied to everything about him, other than his clothes, pickaxe, and light. I remember looking at the car clock shortly after passing him. It was almost exactly 1 a.m. when we passed. We never saw a car. We never saw a horse. We never saw any way for this old, sickly, pale miner to have gotten into the park. There was no reason for him to be there. Any means of transportation would have been visible, if nearby. Worst of all, we estimated that this miner had to have been standing there, facing us, for at least an hour and a half, never moving. The eeriest part, by far, was how still he'd been the whole time, waiting, perhaps, to see us. Not once did that light flicker, as if he looked down for a moment or turned his head. He just stood there, staring down a road at a car full of idiots. Even when we were parked, 
headlights off and climbing on some rocks while balancing a beer in hand, he stared from miles away into the darkness in our direction. We would have been no more than darkness to any human that far away without our headlights. We never saw him again. However, a few years ago, I decided to check to see if anybody had ever experienced something similar. I found one other story of a couple that saw him almost in the same place that we did, standing there staring down the road late at night. Then I found another story of some people who were camping out in the dark away from the standard campsites, and they saw the silhouette of what they thought was a miner walking by very close to them. I wish we would have stopped. Even if it would have been the most horrifying thing ever, I wish we would have stopped because I honestly believe there was a ghost of a dead miner out in that park. And I would know for sure today. I wouldn't have so many questions. There are plenty of unexplained things that I've encountered in my life. But the visage of the miner still sits fresh to this day. This happened almost 30 years ago, and I cannot forget about this person, if it was a person. I was spending the night at my boyfriend's mom's house, which I did almost every weekend while he was away at sea. Usually I slept on the couch in the family room, which was quite comfortable. Mrs. D always left a nightlight on in each room in case anybody needed to get up during the night. I awoke for some reason, and standing right before me was a fellow who looked like he was about to die of thirst. He was terribly sunburned, and his hair looked like it was sunbleached, almost like hay. He didn't say a word, but looked at me with such sorrow and hopelessness. He was dressed in worn clothes that I later found out were identical to some of the old 1860s photos of miners. This all happened in Santa Ana, California, just for some added context. His cotton shirt was collared and buttoned down, but very soiled. He had a cotton jacket of some sort as well. His boots were also of leather and very dirty and worn. His eyes were light and clear, but also very sad. His skin was creased and cracked looking. He didn't answer me when I asked if he was okay, so I said that I would go and wake Mrs. D. At this point, I genuinely didn't think he was a ghost. I thought he was alive and maybe an old friend of the family's. It would have been totally natural, since this family had many friends and relatives that regularly came to visit. Anyway, I got up to go toward the hall where Mrs. D's bedroom door was, but when I turned to him as I passed, he was gone. There is absolutely no physical way that he could have gotten out of the house in that amount of time without me hearing it or noticing. He literally disappeared in front of my eyes. I never saw him after that, but to this day, I feel a deep sadness and compassion for the man who might have died trying to find some gold or silver after the gold rush was already over. The look of desperation on his face is one that I will never forget. I'm telling this story to maybe get some help in identifying what I saw, because I've been trying to figure it out for three years. I was a U.S. Marine from 2014 to 2019. I deployed to the Philippines to help out some joint operations. It was right after the siege of Marawi. Basically all we did was stare at the top of the jungle canopy looking for heat signals and then communicating fire missions for artillery. 
We were about three months into the deployment and like four hours into this mission staring at absolutely nothing. We were over the mountains of Bastlon with really thick jungle canopy. Even with infrared, it's really hard to see anything out there. It was like trying to find needles in a haystack with Vaseline in your eyes. But when something's above the canopy, like a helicopter, birds, or monkeys in the trees, it pops up and you can really get some good definition depending on how good the camera operator is and atmospherics, of course. I was the camera guy and I was just chilling, staring into the void while my pilot burned circles into the sky for hours. I asked my officer in charge of the flight if I could go smoke while the pilot took over the camera after I locked on to a geopoint to keep the camera from going all over the place, and he said yes. So I go smoke, and not a minute later, I hear the guy inside flying go, Uh, hey dude, you should get back in here and look at this. So I go back inside all pissed off because I hadn't got to finish my cigarette. But then I see what my pilot had locked the camera onto. I hopped back into my seat, and I took back control. I was like, alright, is it cows or Isis? But it's none of those things. It's just flying above the canopy at a pretty good clip, flapping and gliding on what I can only assume are very large pointed wings. At this point, it's just a very dark shape moving over the canopy, until I clean up the infrared image and start to pick out more. At first I'm like, dude, it's just a really big bird. But then I see like a rounded head at the front and a small space in between what I assumed was the tail, making me think it had some kind of legs. The detail wasn't amazing, but you could make out general shapes. If I have a good day for atmospherics and light and altitude, I can tell an RPG from an AK-47 if I'm lucky. That kind of detail. Then my smart, college-educated officer is like, check the measuring tool. It looks kind of big. We have a tool that uses geodata, altitude, and the aircraft's position, allowing you to use the laser and the program to let you know how far a distance is between two points. We mostly use it to measure buildings and artillery shot distances, but given what we had in the height of the canopy, I didn't see why it wouldn't work for this too. So I take a screen cap of my cam and I send it to my pilot to work on while I'm still on lock. He does the math and he comes up with a roughly 6 foot length and a 17 foot wingspan. As I watched it fly, I just kept thinking, that looks like a bat. Just the way that it flapped and moved and the general shape. It wasn't a bird, and its wings definitely came out at like an angle and stretched, you know, just like a bat. But there's no bat that big. The crew and I talked about it, passed it up to hire, but eventually we had to actually go do our jobs instead of become amateur zoologists. But after that flight, I just couldn't shake that feeling or place what it was. The other thing was that right next to our smoke pit, when we're not flying the drones, there's this thing that's absolutely filled with fruit bats, and it glows in infrared. This thing didn't. So my pilot and I got curious and we started asking the local people and contractors who worked at the chow hall and at the PX. A bunch of them laughed and told us that it was because we stay up too late and we work too long on night shift. But a couple of the older ones told us about an aswang or a tik tik. Sometimes people call it a mananangal. Apparently it's this big old flying thing that eats babies. But in an effort to disprove giant baby-eating women man bats, can somebody please tell me what I saw? Because I would much rather my spicy PTSD just be regular PTSD. To be fair, I don't know if this is paranormal or somebody playing a prank on me, but I'd like to hear your thoughts all the same. 
I've lived in the same studio apartment for four years now, and along one wall is a closet with a mirrored sliding door. I've never cleaned this mirror since I never really touch it, so it doesn't have any smudges on it or anything like that. At least, I never noticed any smudges on it. Until tonight. Last night, I was cooking in my apartment with the windows closed. It was a cold night. And because of the steam from the food, it's all one room, so the kitchen is in the same room as my closet, I noticed that my mirror had gotten a bit fogged up. I didn't think anything of it at the time, but as I was walking by the mirror today, I noticed that the top part of my mirror was still a bit foggy looking, and I could see words written on the mirror as if somebody had drawn them with their finger or the eraser of a pencil since the lines are fairly thin. The printing is neat, like teacher writing. The lettering doesn't resemble the handwriting of anybody I know. I assumed that the person who had lived in the apartment before me had traced out words along the top of the mirror, and that the steam from the cooking had only just now revealed them. I was curious about what the former resident had to say, so I picked up an index card and a clipboard and started copying out what the words said. It was tough because they were faint. They only showed up when the light in the room wasn't shining directly on them, and the first part of the writing was a bit obscured. They said in all lowercase letters, being dead isn't being alive. I'm not really sure what to think. It seems kind of tautological. Obviously being dead isn't being alive, right? I mean, by definition. But I'm curious about how the writing got there, and a little freaked out. In all the time I've lived here, the only person who's ever been in the house when I wasn't home is my mom. And she wouldn't do that. And even if she did, it wasn't her handwriting. Every other person who's been in the apartment has been there at the same time as me. And I think that I would have noticed somebody writing on my mirror. So I'm at a bit of a loss. Maybe the previous resident just left a spooky message to mess with me and I never saw it until now. Or maybe my little apartment is haunted. What do you think? This story is from my brother-in-law. It took place in Mexico in the 90s. My brother-in-law, Uriel, and his family had a house on the corner of the street. His parents always worked and never had time to do the house chores or look after Uriel, so they hired a housekeeper and nanny. The nanny was a girl who was around 12 years old. It was acceptable back then to hire young kids in that area. Uriel said that in the beginning, everything was great, and she did all of her chores. The house was pretty big, so it was pretty impressive that at her age, she was able to keep up with all that work. The family was content with her work, and the girl was always happy to help. In the house, there was a big staircase that led up to a second story. Uriel said that as soon as you got on to the top step, there was a large Victorian mirror which was recently given to his parents by some acquaintances. The family started noticing that the girl would always glance at the mirror. The glances then escalated, and she began staring at the mirror from afar. Soon she would stare, to the point where she would stop doing her chores entirely, and just stay there for hours at a time. She stopped speaking to anyone, and did nothing else but stare at the mirror, she even stopped eating and sleeping. The family became very concerned and alerted her family. When her family came to pick her up, they couldn't separate the girl from the mirror. She was in sort of a hypnotized state. They took her to the local witch doctor, and the witch doctor said something in there had taken her, that it had just left her body behind, and that nothing could be done. She was in a vegetative state and remained like that for some days. It would all come to an end when Uriel's family ordered to have the mirror stored in the basement. At one point, one of the few people moving it somehow stepped on the mirror and it broke. It shattered into many pieces 
Seconds later, the girl's family called Uriel's family, saying that the girl had been convulsing and that she passed away. It was very sad and the family was devastated. To this day, he still doesn't like talking about it because it scared him so much. For context, I've been doing gymnastics for nine years, and we had some weird shit happen at our old gym. We moved to a new facility in December of 2017, but the creepy stuff didn't end there. Here is one of those stories. This didn't happen to me, but it happened to two of my coaches, who I believe and trust with my life, literally. They wouldn't lie about these things. Gabby and Maya are the only two people who stay in the gym after hours on our practice nights. This particular night was a Thursday. Before this, we had seen handprints all over the mirrors and things like that. The gym we moved into post-handprints was a high school gymnasium, and to exit there are two sets of glass doors with a shoe mat in the space between. They walk a few feet down the hallways of the old school to leave. Maya was in the front and Gabby was behind her. Maya saw a man reflected in the glass. If you think, how could she see that? It's pitch black outside by the time they leave, so reflections really show up in the glass. She says he was white and tall with shaggy dark hair down to his ears. He starts to run toward them. Maya thought maybe he wanted to ask them a question, so she turned around. Gabby ran into her, since Maya is taller and she couldn't see the reflection, but she heard footsteps coming quickly close to them. There was no one there, though. The man was gone, but both of them knew that there had definitely been someone there. I served in Marja, Helmand province during 2010 to 2011, where I had a series of strange experiences. Among them, I saw the mysterious lights in the sky that another person had reported, but one incident in particular struck absolute terror into me. One night, I was standing guard at my post alone, sometime between 0200 and 0400. The night was uncharacteristically quiet, which was strange given that there were usually dogs barking and goats randomly screaming. My post was situated at the northeast corner of our forward operating base, or FOB, isolated and a good 100 yards plus from the next post. Built on part of a mud wall enclosing the compound, the post was like an enclosed treehouse, elevated about 15 feet high. A sturdy roof allowed for an additional vantage point. Nearby was a mud hut, where some Afghan security guards slept. I was immersed in thought, sipping on rippets and pondering my life choices, when suddenly I heard something running along the wall behind me. Since the wall was only a foot thick, it would be impossible for a person to run atop it. The sound was not like a dog's. It was more of a noise, like the tapping of talons. As it reached the section of concertina wire near the top of the wall, the creature leaped onto the roof of my post, stomping its feet right above my head. It sounded like a full-grown man intentionally intimidating me. Then, just as swiftly, it sprinted full speed, leaping onto the roof of the mud hut where the Afghan guards slept and disappearing into the darkness. I didn't see it, but I heard it, and I felt its presence. Panic set in, and I found myself frantically scanning with the thermal sights of my 240B machine gun, but I couldn't locate the creature anywhere. I was certain it was neither human nor animal. Its movements were too different, too deliberate. It was as if a large man had been stomping, 
but the way it leaped off was so rapid and fluid, as though it knew precisely where to go. That experience marked the most frightened I have ever been in my life, and until now, I have never shared it with anyone. The memory of that night continues to haunt me, an unexplained encounter that, as far as I'm concerned, defies all logic and reason. So, my mom has this full stand mirror that my grandpa made for her when she was a teen. She's had it basically forever and is super attached to it. I, on the other hand, am terrified of it and hate being anywhere near it. I often have unexplained experiences involving this mirror, like seeing things in it, dark, heavy feelings in the room that just sort of sit in the mirror. Well, recently, I had a baby, and he's nine months old now, crawling, learning, all that stuff the babies do. My mom lets me come over to take naps in her room while she watches my little one, which helps a lot. Except that her mirror is in her room. The first time I took her up on the offer, I had a dream about a little girl ghost that kept showing herself to me, and then running away. I awoke all groggy and weird, and very drained. I couldn't really explain why I was dreaming about her, if she was real or just my imagination. Eventually I just said whatever and left it at that. The second time not much happened other than the fact that I just could not wake up. My body felt like a ton of bricks, and my limbs wouldn't follow any directions that my brain sent their way. I got up at some point, but only because I could hear my son downstairs crying. The last time was craziest of all. No dreams, I slept only an hour and a half, and everything that happened was just crazy to me. The ghostly activity actually started before I went to nap. I had taken my son upstairs to nap in his playpen, which is placed right in front of that mirror, and when I laid him down and stood up to leave, I heard whispering, but I couldn't make out any of the words. I shrugged it off and then went back downstairs. As I was chilling on the couch, I started to hear this whispering again. I tried ignoring it, because honestly I didn't feel threatened in any way, and I just kept playing around on my phone. After a while of that, I started hearing someone walking around upstairs. Not my son, as he can't walk yet anyway, and he was in a playpen so it couldn't have been him. No one else was home. Obviously I was a little shaken up, but I was still going to ignore it. But then I noticed this toy dinosaur thing lighting up. It has a big red button on top of its head that lights up when it's pressed. Manually pressed. Normally it goes off for a little while after it gets pressed, but this was way after my son was playing with it. And it was like it was just being pressed over and over. The preset sayings would never come all the way through. They just kept going on like their first three words or so. I thought that was creepy and I started to get uneasy. A little bit after that, I decided to go upstairs and take a nap as well. When I get into the room, I get that familiar feeling of uneasiness that the mirror always gives me. I side glanced at it and then just tried to ignore it. My little one was asleep and safe, so I wasn't worried about him. I crawled into bed and was on my phone for a couple more minutes when I started hearing the wordless whispers again. I ignored them and tried to fall asleep, but it felt like I was trapped between being awake and being asleep. During that time, I heard all sorts of creaking sounds, walking, things like that. At one point, it sounded like somebody was rubbing their hand really fast across the blanket or sheets. Eventually, I somehow fell asleep. And like I said, I was only asleep for about an hour and a half. But an hour into my nap, my brother got home. He's 11. And he came upstairs because he heard my baby. He was very quiet, barely making any noise. But when he said something to my little one in a whisper, I woke up startled. After reassuring me that it was just him and not some ghost person stalking me, 
he took my baby downstairs to let me rest a little longer. I set my alarm for 30 minutes, fell back asleep, but instead of my alarm waking me up, I awoke six minutes early, and as I was opening my eyes, all I could see, all over the walls, were words. They were written very messily, and I couldn't make out anything at all, but it was all I could see for what felt like a very long time, but it could only have been a minute or so. When I turned my phone on to check the time, the words went away, but I was definitely on edge, and I was shaking. I tried to take a moment to calm down, but in the vanity mirror, which was looking toward that other mirror, something shifted and flew across it. I jumped up and got the hell out of there. When I told my mom, she just laughed, and my husband made fun of me for always getting into these crazy ghost situations. But I just came over to have a good time and relax, not be spooked by some crazy ghost. Anyway. I wanted to note that for the majority of the experience, I was alone with my son. It all started happening once my mom left to go do some Uber Eats deliveries, and when I woke up the second time, my brother and son were downstairs playing. I don't know if I'm just crazy, or if there's really something going on with that mirror. So this happened when I was about 14 years old. My house is not haunted, and never was, but I'm sure that in the first years after we moved in, when I was about 9 years old, there was a harmless spirit that still lingered around at the time. I was in our second bathroom, washing my hands, and after I finished and wiped them with a cloth, I looked in the mirror. I had no expression on my face. I was just looking at myself in the mirror, but my reflection tilted its head to the right and gave me a big smile while looking directly into my eyes. I am completely sure that I did not smile or tilt my head when I saw that. My expression must have changed to pure horror, but the face in the mirror didn't. I ran out of the bathroom, but I noticed that my reflection just sort of stayed there. It didn't run along with me. This has never happened to me before or after, but it still has me thinking why this happened and how it's even possible. Maybe I don't want to know. Most of these experiences are second-hand. They mostly happened to my best friend at the house he used to live in. I had one experience in the house, and I'll start with that because it's the least interesting. The stuff that happened to my friend is much more difficult to explain. This happened when I was around 21, four years ago. I was picking up my friend so we could go out to a movie and I had come inside to hang out in the kitchen with his mom while he finished getting ready. It was already dark out, and the house was mostly dark too. Only the light from the kitchen was on. I got tired of waiting for him, so I decided to head out to my car to listen to music while I waited. I walked down the darkened hallway toward the front door. The way the house was situated, the front sitting room was off to the right as you walked toward the door. In that room, against the wall, was a couch, and over it, a large oval mirror. As I walked past the sitting room, I was overcome with this feeling of dread. I knew that I had to keep my eyes straight ahead on the front door, and that if I turned my head to the right and looked in the mirror, I would see something that shouldn't be there, something that would give me nightmares. I practically ran out the front door. Later, when I told my friend about that feeling, he just sort of nodded sagely and said, Yeah, I don't look in that mirror. That's the only experience I've ever had with the paranormal. And let's face it, it was really just a frightening feeling in a dark house, and mirrors are creepy anyway. But my friend swears up and down that the following experiences are true, 
and since he's generally very honest, rational, and not attention-seeking, I believe him. I have no proof, just his words that I choose to believe are the truth. My friend believes there were at least two spirits in that house. One was benevolent, the other less so. And there were a few experiences that seemed to be isolated incidents. He says that he would sometimes see a woman's face in his closet. She was the nice spirit. He said that she seemed like she was just there, watching over him, that she never spoke, just appeared sometimes and watched him. The other spirit was not so kind. My friend says that he would often feel as though something were following him down the long hallway that led from the bedrooms to the kitchen. On one occasion, he says that he tripped over something hard, but when he looked down, the hallway was devoid of any object that could have caused him to trip. On another occasion, he felt something like claws scratch his calf while walking down the same hallway. Again, there was nothing around that could have caused such a sensation. This last experience is the one that I think is the creepiest of all, the one for which I have absolutely no explanation. My best friend and two of our other friends were sitting in the front room, the same room with the couch and the creepy mirror. They were just watching TV and chatting. Suddenly my best friend noticed that they were not alone in the room. Sitting in a chair that was only moments before completely empty, was a man he had never seen before. He was dressed in an old-fashioned, think 1940s, suit and hat. He says the man had a beard, and that he didn't speak or look at them. He just sat there. He stared at the man, stunned. After a minute or two, the man faded away. This is the part that really freaked me out. My other friend who was in the room saw him too and both friends later described him the exact same way. The third friend only saw an empty chair. I'm sure there are logical explanations for some or maybe all of these things, but I don't know how to explain these things. I'm just passing along some stories that I hope somebody will find interesting. I've been feeling incredibly shitty lately. Turns out going through a breakup and letting go isn't the easiest thing in the world, and I just haven't been happy. Yesterday I had a shower, and after getting out, I was looking at my foggy reflection in the steamed up mirror. It was one of those weird self-reflection moments that you see on TV or something. I drew a smiley face with my finger over my own face. Dramatic? Yeah, probably but I just felt like doing it. So just now, after having a bath, I was looking at myself in the same mirror while drying my hair. The mirror had since cleared and steamed over again, so my original smiley face had gone. But now, there was another, smaller one, slightly to the right of where mine had been. I know people are rightly going to be skeptical, and I am too. I'm fully aware of paradelia and similar effects, so maybe it's nothing. Maybe it's just parts of the mirror that unsteamed or whatever and that's how it looked afterward, but it still looks like a drawn face to me. I did think it could have been my dad, but he always complains if I draw on the mirror or car windows because it takes so long to clear or something like that. I don't really know the science of it, but I just know that it annoys him. I'll ask him tomorrow. Part of me is hoping it's my dad, but the other part is hoping that it wasn't and that this is just my own little message from somebody who's watching. If it wasn't him that did it, I think it's kind of nice. Do spirits pick up on people's feelings? Was it someone watching over me and giving me a smiley face back? I know it doesn't seem like much, but it's an experience that really sat with me, and I just thought I'd share it.
I was in the armed forces in my younger years, and my first duty location was in Okinawa, Japan. I was stationed in Kadena, and was living in the dorms, barracks for army personnel. Anyway, we all had our own rooms at the time, but each room was linked to another through a shared bathroom. You could lock your room from your bathroom door for added security. My bathroom mate was a tall black dude, for the sake of the story we'll call him B. I was asleep one night, and I awoke with a feeling of somebody watching me. I look near the foot of my bed and I see this tall, dark figure. I was super groggy, possibly hungover, but I just remember saying, B, get the F out of my room, you weirdo, and I proceeded to fall right back asleep. I awoke the next morning and I go through my routine for work when I realized that my bathroom door was still locked, from my side. Weird. I brushed it off, and I went to B's shop during the day to look for him and ask him about the night prior. I talked to his shop lead, and was told that B was temporary duty for about two weeks, and has been gone for a couple of days now. Essentially, he was on a business trip. I have never felt the same in my room since that night, and I only told a few people this story. Okinawa is extremely haunted, since there was so much history during World War II and before. As a bonus, I told B about it when he got back, and he laughed at me, saying that perhaps I was the weirdo. I also don't remember any strange feelings when that figure was at my bed, except for the feeling of being watched, which is what woke me up in the first place. I had other stories that happened to me while I was there, but suffice it to say that Okinawa is definitely haunted. The Ghostly Sentinel of Acadia Acadia National Park, with its rugged coastline and dense forests, has always held a certain allure for me especially because of the Native American history. Drawn by the park's nocturnal beauty, I embarked on a nighttime exploration, a decision that led me to an encounter both awe-inspiring and unsettling. The night was clear, full of stars illuminating the sky. The park was serene, its usual daytime bustle, replaced by the quiet sounds of nature. As I walked along the coastal path, the sound of waves crashing against the cliffs was like a soothing backdrop. It was when I reached a particularly secluded cove that I first sensed something odd. A chill ran through the air, distinct from the night's coolness. Standing atop a rocky outcrop was a figure silhouetted against the moonlit sky. It was the form of a man, but his presence felt ancient, otherworldly. He was motionless, gazing out over the ocean, as if in eternal vigil. I stood frozen, watching him. His attire was that of a Native American warrior, with traditional clothing and a feathered headdress. I had heard stories from locals about a ghostly sentinel, rumored to be the spirit of a Native American protector of the land, but I had always dismissed them as mere folklore. As I watched, the figure turned and locked eyes with me. His gaze was piercing, but I felt no malice, only a profound sense of sadness and a fierce sense of guardianship. In that moment, it was as if he was communicating without words, imparting a message of respect and responsibility for the land he once called home. I don't know how long we stood there in that silent communion, but suddenly, as if a spell had been broken, he vanished, leaving no trace behind. The night air returned to its usual temperature, and the sound of the waves regained prominence. I left the cove deeply affected by the encounter. In my subsequent research, I learned more about the indigenous peoples of the region and their deep connection to the land. The ghostly sentinel of Acadia, whether a figment of the park's storied past or a genuine experience, served as a powerful reminder to me of the history and cultures that predated the national park a history that demands recognition and respect. 
I walked away with a deep appreciation for the experience that I had had. And whatever that experience was, I am eternally grateful for it. The Entity of Pine Mountain by Joseph R. My encounter in the dense, shadow-laden woods of Pine Mountain in Kentucky was an experience that profoundly altered my understanding of the natural and the supernatural. Pine Mountain, cloaked in legends and eerie tales, has always been a magnet for those fascinated by the unexplained. I had ventured into these woods for a solo hiking trip, drawn by its rugged beauty and the solitude it promised. The first day passed without incident, filled with the tranquil sounds of nature and the scenic views of the Appalachian landscape. As night fell on the second day, I set up my camp near a small clearing. The darkness in these woods felt deeper, more consuming, as if it had a quality all its own. I sat by the campfire, the flames casting dancing shadows around me. That's when I first heard it. A faint whispering, like voices carried on the wind. Initially, I thought it was just the breeze rustling through the leaves, but the whispering grew louder and more coherent. It sounded like a conversation, but in a language I couldn't understand. Intrigued and unsettled in equal measure, I ventured toward the source. The whispering seemed to be emanating from a dense thicket of trees near the edge of the clearing. As I approached, a sense of dread began to build within me. The air grew colder, and a mist began to rise from the ground, swirling around the trees. And then I saw it. A shadowy, formless entity amongst the trees, its shape shifting and undulating, as if made of smoke. It was the source of the whispers, which now sounded almost chant-like a chorus of ethereal voices that filled the night air. Rooted to the spot, I felt an overwhelming sense of, I don't know, unearthliness. The entity seemed ancient, as old as the mountains themselves, and its presence was both terrifying and mesmerizing. I couldn't decipher the words, but the whispers evoked images of times long past, of lives lived and lost within the woods. As quickly as it had appeared, the entity vanished, the whispers dissipating into the night with it. The sudden silence was almost deafening. I hurried back to my campsite, my heart pounding away in my chest. I spent a restless night, jumping at every sound, every crackle of a branch. The woods felt alive, aware, and watchful. As dawn broke, I packed up quickly, eager to leave the oppressive atmosphere of the clearing. Later, at a nearby town, I recounted my experience to a local at a bar. I thought he would laugh it off, but he told me about an old legend, a spirit of the mountain, said to communicate with the living, offering glimpses of ancient wisdom and warnings. My encounter in the woods of Pine Mountain was a journey into the unknown, a brush with something that defied explanation. I still don't know what it was, whether it was the spirit that man told me about, or whether it was something else entirely, but I feel like I touched the other side, and this side hasn't quite felt the same since. This happened to me almost a year ago, and I still can't explain it. My mom and I and my siblings went on a cruise in October of 2019. After a trip to Calgary, I went back to our cabin, while the other three already went to the restaurant. I just wanted to bring our bags to the cabin and then go to the restaurants too. So I entered our cabin, and everything started to feel... blurred. 
I can't find a better word for it. I started to feel very confused, and I wasn't even sure I was in the right cabin anymore, even though I opened the door by myself with our key. I checked the room and decided, yeah, that's our room, but this weird, confused feeling stayed. Then I noticed my mom's old, golden phone with the broken screen and a picture of my siblings as a background on the table. I asked myself, why did they bring her old phone to this cruise? And flight mode wasn't turned on, and that made me pretty angry. So I took the phone, turned on flight mode, and left the room to find my family in the restaurant. When I arrived there, I asked them about the phone, but nobody knew that they took it with us on the cruise. I didn't believe them, but I also started to doubt what I saw since I was already feeling so weird. We went back to our cabin, and the phone was gone. I had touched this phone, picked it up, turned on flight mode, and set it right back down. I started to feel very uncomfortable about what happened, but still, nobody believed me. After a while of discussing, my family decided to ask housekeeping about the phone. And yes, there was a phone. As a reminder, I saw a golden phone with a broken screen with a photo of my siblings on it, and the phone language was German. But the phone that had really been there was black, with a template as a background, and the phone language was Hindi. It was the phone of the housekeeper. He had forgotten it in our room and took it back when I left the cabin. But why did I see what I saw? Why did I have this extreme blurry feeling as soon as I entered that room? Why would I have seen my mom's old phone instead of that one, and our pictures, in German? I have no answer to this. I wasn't drinking, it wasn't hot. I have no idea how to explain this. An Hour I Can't Remember by Nomad67. I've been sailing for over a decade. Recently, I decided to take my boat out on the open ocean, just a few miles off the Californian coast. The day was bright, the sky clear, and the sea's expanse lay shimmering before me. Around mid-afternoon, I spotted something odd on the horizon, a peculiar shimmering distortion like you'd see on a hot road in the middle of summer. Intrigued, I decided to sail closer. As I approached the distortion, I felt a sudden wave of dizziness. My instrument started to behave erratically, my compass spinning wildly. The shimmering grew more intense, now encompassing my entire field of vision. There was an odd sensation of being pulled forward and then nothing. The next thing I remember is finding myself seated inside my boat, angered. The sun, which was high in the sky moments before, was now setting, painting the horizon in brilliant hues of orange and pink. My wristwatch and the boat's clock confirmed my unease. I had lost several hours. There was no sign of the shimmering distortion. My instruments were back to normal, and everything was eerily calm, as though the ocean itself was holding its breath. Now, I'm familiar with stories of the Bermuda Triangle and its tales of missing time and navigational anomalies, but this was thousands of miles from there. I hurried back to shore, trying to shake off the unsettling feeling. Once docked, I checked every instrument, even reviewed my GPS logs. Oddly, there was a straight line gap in the tracking, corroborating with the hours I couldn't account for. I've tried to rationalize it, and perhaps I passed out due to some sudden health issue, or maybe there's a logical explanation, like an electromagnetic phenomenon. But deep down, something tells me that this was different. I am half Japanese, female, 
living in Japan and working as a translator interpreter. A few years ago, I got hired for an awesome project as an interpreter for a producer and an award-winning director for a movie that was to be filmed in Okinawa. The movie didn't come through because there weren't enough sponsors though. Anyway, we got flown to Okinawa and I was excited on so many accounts, plus it was my first time to Okinawa. Everything was amazing. The friendly and warm Okinawan people, the food, the weather, and the beautiful beaches until we reached the resort hotel. Three key team members, including myself, were on the same floor. Our rooms were side by side. I remember as I walked up to my room door, I felt like something was off. I knocked firmly three times on the door, something I was always told to do by my father who has traveled around the world for work. As I opened the door to the room, about six feet away, I see an apparition of a lady standing there, looking at me. I thought, well, shit. But I had no choice. I'm here for work. She looked like a Japanese lady in her 20s or 30s, with long, dark hair. It was kind of neat. She was wearing a long, light-colored, bluish-white dress with some sort of a faint floral print as though it had faded with time. She also looked darkish overall, energy-wise, like there was a slight dark gray mist surrounding her or emanating from her. I stood at the entrance and spoke politely in Japanese. Hello, excuse me. I am not here to disturb your peace or your space. I am here just for three days for work and I will leave after that. Thank you for understanding. I bowed deeply before entering. It seemed as though she understood me and mostly left me alone, although she barely leaves the spot she was standing in and just watches me whenever I am in the room. Each time I have to enter or leave the room or have to go to the kitchenette or the toilet and bath areas, I would have to walk by her. My best friend was in between jobs then, and whenever I was back in the hotel room, she would spend the entire time on the phone with me so that I was less afraid, since being on the phone means I'm distracted from the lady who was always looking at me. I could feel her watching me, even as I showered, so I had to have my best friend on speakerphone while I did so. The kitchenette area near where she usually stands is also colder than the rest of the room, even though the air conditioning isn't there. I was really grateful that it was quite a spacious room, enough for four people. There were two beds and two futons for the tatami area, so this gives me some space between me and the staring lady. I slept with the lights and TV on, but at around 2 to 3 a.m., I would just wake up in shock and that's because she had come close to me to watch me sleep. It happened every night that I was there. I got the feeling that she was just curious about somebody who could see her, but nonetheless, it was quite a nerve-wracking experience. Before I left, I bowed to her again and thanked her for sharing her space. I don't think I will forget that work trip anytime soon. Paranormal Experience in the Woods of Eastern Kentucky by user 1refrigerator465 posted to r slash paranormal. I'm posting this mostly to try and find some sort of community or answers. I am in Moorhead, Kentucky and have been experiencing unexplainable things while I've been hiking around Eagle Lake or near Cave Run. I'm not a superstitious person and I'm very rational when it comes to the animals in our region. It will sound as if something is approaching, much closer than any animal should. And when I notice, I react or stomp my feet, it stops. This unrelenting dread and overwhelming anxiety falls over me and I can't shake it. 
and I know I have to leave at that point. Each time as I've started to leave, whatever it is has charged quickly, coming much closer and essentially chasing me from where I've been. I refused to return to Eagle Lake after I experienced it the first time, and I chose to go to a pretty popular area near Cave Run. The same exact thing has happened more than once. I have not been able to shake the feeling. I have definitely been the only one in the area on both occasions, and there have been no animals nearby. Definitely not ones large enough to make the sounds that I've heard. My girlfriend has been with me on each occasion, and has heard and felt the same thing as me. If anyone has seen, felt, or heard something similar, please let me know. The Burned Man Upstairs by user KentuckyWitch0828, posted to r slash paranormal. This story is from a while back, before I moved to my current home. In 2016, my mom and I moved into a very old home. Over the few years we lived there, we had quite a few experiences, but the most notable for me personally was the incident of where I came face to face with the burned man upstairs. It was a weeknight, and I had school the next day. At around midnight, I went to bed, which was a bit early for me at the time. A few hours later, I woke up drenched in sweat. My fan was turned off. Annoyed, I rolled over to turn it back on, and I looked up at my door, noticing that it was open. The door opened a little bit more, and a strange-looking nude man was standing before me. He seemed abnormally tall, I'd say almost six foot. His head was nearly touching the door frame, and his skin appeared off, similar to somebody who's received a skin graft after being burned. It appeared visibly tacky and wasn't very pleasant to look at, but its face was even worse. The skin on its mouth seemed to have been drawn back, exposing the gums fully, and one eye seemed far too small, and the other far too large. Whatever this was, it just stood there in my doorway, looking at me. It smiled after it made eye contact with me. To this day, I can't tell you why I responded this way. I get grumpy when I first wake up, and this was no exception. Basically, I told this thing to F off and rolled over and fell back asleep after turning my fan back on, of course. That morning, my door was still open, but nothing was there. I went into full panic mode, the reality of it all having finally settled into my awake mind, and I refused to sleep up there for weeks. It didn't help much that by that point, I had a lot more stories from that house. Some things to consider. This home was once a funeral home, which did have a fire a long time ago. I'm not sure if anyone was hurt or killed in this fire or not. I always sleep with my door closed, and I remember closing my door that night. It was a bit finicky, however, as there was no lock. And due to the house shifting, if you stepped on a certain floorboard, it would pop open. However, this almost always wakes me up, and I would have noticed it. At no point did I feel threatened during this encounter, despite its strange appearance. I have a respectful fear of the paranormal. Out of all the other experiences in this house, this was the one time that I did not feel scared or creeped out by a paranormal event. I never talked about it after the first time it happened, and nobody but my mom knew until now. My mom's friend and their little boy moved in. Despite nobody telling him about what I saw, he would wake up screaming in the dead of night and whenever we would check and ask him what was wrong, he would talk about the tall man with the weird face.
The Woods of Aroostook. I've always been drawn to the serene beauty of Aroostook County, Maine. The dense forests, the rolling hills, and the sense of isolation. It's like stepping into another world. Last summer, I decided to take a solo camping trip, seeking solitude and a break from my hectic city life. Little did I know, I was about to encounter something beyond the realm of normalcy, something that would forever change my perception of the world. I arrived at a secluded campsite nestled deep in the woods. The first couple of days were idyllic, just me, the chirping birds, and the rustling leaves. However, on the third night, things took a bizarre turn. As the sun dipped below the horizon, a strange feeling washed over me. The forest, usually alive with nocturnal sounds, fell eerily silent. I sat by the dying campfire, trying to shake off the unease. That's when I first heard it, a faint whispering, like voices carried by the wind. At first, I thought it was my imagination, the product of being alone in the woods, but the whispers grew louder, more distinct. What truly sent chills down my spine was when I realized the whispers were reciting memories, my memories, secrets I had never shared with anyone. I stood up, my heart pounding in my chest, and scanned the shadowy tree line. There was nothing but the gentle swaying of the trees. The whispers, however, continued, growing more personal, more accusatory. They spoke of regrets from my past, mistakes I had buried deep within, it felt as though the trees themselves were speaking, their leaves rustling with every word spoken about my life. In a panic, I decided to leave, to escape the accusing chorus of the woods. As I hastily packed my gear, the whispers morphed into a cacophony of voices all speaking at once. I couldn't understand them anymore, but the tone was unmistakable. It was angry, almost vengeful, I hurried through the dark forest, guided only by the beam of my flashlight and the overwhelming desire to get as far away as possible. The whispers followed me, echoing through the trees. It was as if the entire forest was alive, aware of my presence, and wanted me gone. Finally, I reached my car, threw my gear in the back seat, and drove away without looking back. As I left the boundaries of the forest, the whispers faded away leaving me in stunned silence. I haven't been back to Aroostook since that night. The experience left me with a lot of questions. What were those whispers? Was it all in my head? A product of isolation? Or had I stumbled upon something truly unexplainable? All I know is I haven't been back, and I don't think I will be anytime soon. I've never been one to believe in ghosts or anything like that, but what happened in my own room has me questioning everything. It was a regular night and I was just lying in bed scrolling through my phone. You know how it is, just winding down. My room was dimly lit by my bedside lamp and everything was normal. Then, out of the corner of my eye, I noticed something odd. It was like a shadow, or more like several shadows sort of shifting around in the corner of my room. At first, I thought my eyes were just playing tricks on me because it was late and I was tired. But the more I looked, the more I realized these weren't normal shadows. They were moving, like swirling and twisting in a way that didn't make any sense, especially since there was nothing moving in my room to cast them. I sat up, trying to focus, thinking maybe it was a trick of the light or something. But no matter how I changed the lighting or my position, the shadows kept moving, almost like they had a mind of their own. It was like watching dark smoke move in slow motion, but there was no source for it. I got out of bed feeling a mix of curiosity and a creeping sense of dread. As I moved closer, the shadows seemed to react, moving faster, almost as if they were aware of me. That's when I got really freaked out. 
I turned on every light in the room, but those shadows in the corner, they just stayed there, unaffected by the light. I didn't sleep much that night. Every time I looked at that corner, those shadows were there, moving and swirling. Somehow I fell asleep and in the morning they were gone. I thought maybe it was all just a dream or in my imagination, but it happened again on several other nights. I've tried everything, rearranging my room, getting different curtains, even having a friend stay over to see if they saw it too, but they didn't. I still see it though, those weird moving shadows, always out of the corner of my eye. It's gotten to the point where I avoid looking at that corner at night. I don't know what it is, a trick of my mind, something with the lighting I haven't figured out, or something paranormal, but it definitely has me looking at my own room in a whole new way. The Vanishing Hiker of Baxter State Park Baxter State Park, with its rugged terrain and vast wilderness, had always been a favorite hiking destination of mine. The towering Mount Katahdin, the sprawling forests, and the sense of adventure always drew me back. However, my last trip there left me with a memory so unsettling it haunts me to this day. It was a crisp morning in early fall when I set out on a solo hike. The trail was challenging, but breathtaking, with colorful autumn leaves blanketing the path. As I trekked deeper into the park, I encountered a fellow hiker. He appeared to be in his 50s, with a weathered face and a warm smile. We struck up a conversation, and he introduced himself as Tom. Tom was knowledgeable about the park and its history. As we walked, he shared fascinating and haunting stories of the area tales of unexplained disappearances, ghost sightings, and eerie legends. His stories were captivating, and they really added an air of mystery to an already pretty mysterious wilderness. After a couple of hours, we reached a clearing, and Tom said that he was taking a different path. We bid each other farewell, and I continued on my hike, pondering the tales he told me about. When I got back to the park's visitor center, I mentioned this encounter to a ranger, telling him all the interesting stories that Tom had shared. The ranger looked deeply unsettled upon hearing the name. He told me that a hiker named Tom had indeed been a regular in the park, but several years ago, he had vanished without a trace. His disappearance had been a big deal, sparking all kinds of searches, but no trace of him was ever found. I stood there with my mind racing, the ranger showed me a picture of Tom from a missing person poster back in the day, and it was undoubtedly the man I had met. It sent a chill down my spine. Had I been walking with a ghost? Was it just a coincidence, or had I encountered something paranormal? I left Baxter State Park that day with a deep sense of unease. The peaceful, familiar trails now seemed shrouded in something darker. The encounter with the vanished hiker the very man who had disappeared in those woods years ago, left me questioning pretty much everything I knew. Dance with the Dead by Kelsey P. I had a bizarre experience on a recent cruise through the Atlantic, and I just needed to share it with people who wouldn't immediately dismiss it as a figment of my imagination. A bit of context, I managed to snag a killer deal for a seven-day cruise trip. The ship was one of those massive luxury liners with all the bells and whistles. About three days in, while we were deep into the Atlantic, I decided to explore some of the less crowded areas of the ship late at night. There's something hauntingly beautiful about the open sea under the moonlight. I made my way down to one of the lower decks. The air grew colder as I descended, which I attributed to being closer to the water. 
I walked along a corridor lined with old black and white photos of past voyages, captains, and vintage shots of the ship. As I continued, I came across a ballroom that looked like it hadn't been updated since the 1920s, a beautiful relic from a bygone era. Deciding to take a closer look, I entered, and that's when I saw her. She was a woman dressed in an old-fashioned flapper dress, dancing alone in the center of the room. Her movements were graceful, yet mournful, like she was waiting for someone who would never come. The strangest part was that I could faintly hear a soft, melancholic tune playing, but there was no visible source for the music. I must have gasped or made some noise because she suddenly stopped and turned to look at me. Her eyes were an eerie shade of blue, almost glowing, filled with an ineffable sadness. I was rooted to the spot, a mix of awe and fear. She tilted her head as if beckoning me to dance. But before I could react, she vanished into thin air, the music fading with her. I stood there, dumbstruck, trying to process what I had just witnessed. Gathering my wits, I rushed back to my cabin. I barely slept that night, my mind wrestling with the possibility that I had seen an apparition. The next day, curiosity got the better of me. I decided to ask one of the older crew members about the ballroom. He hesitated at first, but then shared a ship legend about a young woman named Lila, who had been on the ship's maiden voyage in the 1920s. She was supposed to meet her lover on the ship, and they planned to elope, but he never showed up. And heartbroken, she spent every night dancing alone in that ballroom, until she mysteriously disappeared during the voyage. I'm not one to easily believe in the paranormal, but I can't shake off the feeling that I encountered Lila that night. I worked at a facility in the Rocky Mountains that was originally built as a spa in the early 1900s. Teddy Roosevelt was a frequent visitor. Staff at that time lived on the premises, in the basement to be exact, because commuting was impractical. One of the nurses committed suicide in the basement over a lost love. There were stories of sightings of her from time to time over the decades. A present night shift supervisor who was a fervent disbeliever in all things supernatural and mocked those who did, got the surprise of her life one night. Walking down one of the long hallways while doing rounds, she looked up and saw the nurse in uniform hanging from the ceiling. Everybody in that building heard the supervisor screaming. When she left her shift that morning, she quit and never returned. The Apparition of Tumbledown Mountain My fascination with the paranormal led me to Tumbledown Mountain, a place shrouded in local legend. Rumors spoke of a woman in white, believed to be the spirit of a bride who tragically lost her life on her wedding day in these very hills. With a mix of skepticism and curiosity, I embarked on a climb to experience the beauty of the mountain and perhaps encounter the unknown. The hike was challenging yet invigorating. As I ascended, the dense forest gave way to rocky outcrops and stunning vistas. It was late afternoon when I reached a particularly scenic overlook. That's when I first saw her, a figure in white standing at the edge of the cliff, gazing into the horizon. At first glance, I thought she was another hiker, perhaps admiring the view, but something about her appearance was off her dress seemed out of place, old-fashioned, like something from another era. As I approached cautiously, the air around me grew inexplicably colder. I called out, asking if she needed help, 
but she didn't respond. She just stood there, silent and still. It was only when I came closer that the eerie reality of the situation struck me. She was translucent, her form shimmering in the waning sunlight. I stopped in my tracks, my heart racing. She slowly turned to face me, and her eyes met mine. They were filled with a deep, unspoken sorrow. In that moment, I felt a wave of sadness wash over me, as if her emotions were bleeding into my own consciousness. And then, without a word, she vanished into thin air. One moment she was there, and the next, she was gone, leaving no trace behind. I stood there, dumbfounded, trying to process what I had just witnessed. The temperature returned to normal, and the forest sound seemed to resume, as if nothing had happened. But the image of the spectral woman lingered in my mind. Later, I learned more about the legend. The story went that a young woman, set to be married on Tumbledown Mountain, had fallen to her death on her wedding day. Her spirit, they said, still roamed these hills, forever mourning her lost love and unfulfilled life. The encounter left me with a profound sense of sadness, a feeling that lingered long after I descended from the mountain. The apparition there, whether a figment of local folklore or a genuine paranormal phenomenon, has haunted me ever since, and I'm not sure when I'll be able to go back. And this story isn't mine, but I always thought that it was really interesting, and I recently got permission to tell it. It's strange, but entirely true. And whether you believe it or not, I hope you at least find it interesting too. In the 2000s, my mom, out of nowhere, experienced some unusual occurrences, which I suppose could be described as visions. It only happened a handful of times, and with a pretty large time gap in between them. Each vision was only a few seconds long, during which a vivid and lifelike image or moving scene would gradually materialize in front of her. It lasted long enough for her to see it, and then it dissipated. In the first, in 2000, she was in a cafe at Christmas time and was admiring a fellow customer's long blonde hair, when suddenly she saw her in a casket with her hair tied in a braid. It was so jarring that she left shortly afterward, disturbed by what she had seen and unable to find a cause for it. In the second experience in 2005, she was in a meeting with her attorney, and a scene began playing to the left of her desk, showing the woman in a garden of flowers, dressed in soft, light-colored clothing and glowing with pure happiness, as if she had an aura around her. My mom felt that although it was awkward, she couldn't leave without knowing and decided to tell her what she had seen. The attorney, who had throughout the meeting been very professional but unmoved by anything, was so stunned that she got tears in her eyes and confirmed that it was true. She loved flowers and was happiest when gardening. The third and final time this happened was in 2008, which is my favorite story and the one that I find most interesting. We moved to a new house that year an odd place in that the house itself was tiny, but there was a disproportionately large backyard and a lawn running about 50 feet wide and 140 feet long. At the very end, there was a small embankment or grassy knoll directly behind which sat a canal of water, like the kind that people sail barges down for fun. It was the first time that we had ever lived so close to a body of water and we would watch people sail their boats there on weekends, feed bread to the passing ducks, all was well. But then there came another vision, this time about the water. She was sitting on her bed one morning, just thinking about her day, when a scene began materializing before her. Only unlike the other two, she was a part of this one and not just a spectator. In it, she was a young child who found herself running down to the bottom of our yard one night in order to see the boat that was sailing by. She ran all the way down, just in time to catch the boat as it came past. A 1920s-style riverboat, all lit up, similar to the kind that were popular in the southern states. 
she said that she felt strongly like it was a regular occurrence, running down to catch the boat as it passed, like something she did every week. The boat did not sail on the water of the canal, which of course would have been too shallow, but almost appeared to float as if there was a deeper body of water sitting above the real one. She could see the faces of the people on the boat with perfect clarity, watching them as they waved to her like they knew her. There were women in dresses with parasols and the sound of saloon-style pianos, honky-tonk or something similar. It was like a party was in full swing, she said, everybody having a ball. When the boat had almost fully passed and the vision began to dissolve, my mom's overriding thought afterward was, how could a riverboat fit on a barge canal? She found the whole experience thoroughly eerie, much more than the other two visions, and can still remember the faces and music even now, more than a decade on from the event. She has no connection to the states in which riverboats were popular during that time, being European born and raised, nor any interest in that particular time boat nor riverboats, though she's thoroughly creeped out by them to this day. We were playing a game recently in which a riverboat appeared, and it unsettled her so much that she quit playing. I know it might all mean nothing, and could just be a random glitch of the imagination or a trick of the mind or something. But I find the details very compelling, especially the part about being a child. I hope somebody has some input on it, but either way, I hope you enjoyed the story. I am an atheist. I'm a skeptic, yet something unexplainable happened during a seance at my 16th birthday party a decade ago. It was autumn of 2006. My mother, sister, and I had just moved to a major city from a suburban town about six hours away. As I was a student in a new school, I had decided that inviting some acquaintances over for my birthday would be a good way to get to know people. About 15 to 20 teens showed up at my house at around 7 p.m. Most of the faces I recognized, but some of them I had never met before. I was excited that so many people had showed up, but very nervous to meet new people. A few hours in, we had all become fast friends and were all looking for a bit of fun. A girl I shared Spanish class with, Maria, thought it would be a great idea to hold a seance. Her grandma, a native of Puerto Rico, practiced the art and had taught her a few things throughout her life. Maria seemed to be familiar with the idea of talking to spirits, and we were all down for just about anything. Maria sat up on the living room floor and turned out every light in the house. She gathered a group of people to sit in a circle and hold hands. She told us that we would be reaching out to her deceased cousin, and that it was safest to start with somebody that she had a direct connection to. I was so nervous, but eager to see what would happen. Everyone became very quiet and still. The wind picked up outside, knocking on the walls and windows. You could hear the age of the house declaring its burden of weight. The connection we all had in that moment was eerie and beautiful. Together we joined hands and closed our eyes. Maria began speaking in Spanish. I couldn't understand most of what she was saying, but out of the words I did know, it seemed like she was speaking about her cousin. Maria's voice grew louder and stronger with every word. It seemed like she spoke for an eternity as she commanded the energy in the room. Suddenly, she stopped. Unaware of what was happening, I opened my eyes. The wavering candlelight was the only light source and it was pitch black outside of our circle. In an instant, we heard the sound of glass shattering on the dining room floor. The shrieks of boys and girls alike broke the silence. I panicked. This had my full attention. Maria told everybody to stay put, and she began speaking in a calm voice. Hector, is that you? No response. Hector, this is Maria. I'm reaching out to tell you that I love you. I hope you have found some peace. No response. 
I looked around the room in hopes to find out who was behind this shattering of glass. Everyone was accounted for. No one had left. Then, the sound of a chair being dragged echoed throughout the house. I looked toward the foyer, where the dining room entrance is, just around the bend. I've heard the sound of my dining room chairs moving across the floor many times. There was no mistaking that sound. It was all too familiar, but it filled me with terror. If everyone was in the living room, then who was in the dining room? For a moment, the dragging ceased. I thought it was over. It wasn't. We watched as a chair flew across the foyer and crashed into the mirror that hung from the back of the front door. Everyone started screaming in terror. Someone in the group broke the circle, causing a chain reaction across the whole group. Maria freaked out, exclaiming, No! We all stood up and turned on the lights. This is over, Maria, I said. I walked into the foyer to see a dining room chair on its side. The mirror hanging on the back of the front door was cracked. My mom is going to kill me, I said. Hey, guys? Where's the broken glass? Someone asked. I picked up the chair and walked into the dining room. I expected to see a shattered vase, but there was nothing there. I heard something shattering in this room, Brandy said. I did too, said someone else, but I don't see anything though. What's going on? I don't know, but I don't think that was Hector, Maria said. We broke the circle, so now we'll never know. Es estupido. A look of confusion swept across my face. Mira, you're probably going to have something in your house now. You might want to call a priest and get your house blessed. My cousin did something like this once, and it messed him up for life, Santiago said. We decided that it was time to clean up and wrap up the party. People started saying their goodbyes and left for home. About six people decided they wanted to stay the night, so we had a small slumber party. We left the light on in the dining room, just in case. The next day, the rest of the party guests left. As the last guest left, I closed the door behind them only to see a reminder of the night before, the broken mirror. Finally alone in the house, I started replaying the events in my mind and walking through the foyer and dining room. I searched the entire house for a shattered glass, but I couldn't find anything. I came to the conclusion that someone probably cleaned it up before I could see it for myself. With one mystery solved, I was determined to figure out how someone could have snuck into the dining room and thrown the chair. The living room couch borders the wall next to the entrance into the foyer. It's possible that someone snuck in there when I had my eyes closed in the hand circle, and I just missed them. But if someone did, I didn't know who. It seemed to me that everybody had been accounted for when we were sitting in the living room listening for a response. But I guess anything is possible. I decided to take a picture of the rooms and share them in class on Monday. I took a photo of the hallway, between the dining room and the foyer. The living room is off to the right of the foyer, and a photo of the mirror, behind the front door. I opened my laptop and downloaded them from the camera so that I could share them to MySpace. That's when I noticed that something was off about the photo of the mirror. There seems to be a figure between the staircase and the lamp. I checked the photo on the camera. It was the same thing, a figure in the mirror. Over the last decade, I've had a really hard time trying to figure out what it is, if it's anything at all. Like I said, I'm an atheist and a skeptic, but maybe someone has an answer that I just haven't considered yet. At this point, I'm open to anything. I was working for an ambulance service, and from day one, I would say weird things happened in the hospital and in our building. Things like waking up to door slamming, or one time waking up after I heard somebody say, wake up, like two inches from my face, and getting a call a minute later. It was more so the feeling of breath hitting my face an instant before the words that freaked me out. 
Certain parts of the buildings had a weird feeling, like you were being watched. Occasionally, things moved out of the corner of your eye. Things like that. I know weird stuff happens around sleep, and around lack of sleep, for that matter, so those aren't exactly paranormal experiences for sure. But who knows? This story is different, though, because it wasn't just me. A few winters ago, I was working, and it was snowing. The other medic and I had gone over to the ER to help with a trauma, and when we got back, we were both in the kitchen area, sitting, talking, just letting the adrenaline wear off. Our part of the building was the third floor of a long rectangular building, with one long hallway down the middle, and stairwells at both ends. So, as we're sitting there, we both hear boot steps, walking up one of the set of stairs, getting louder as it gets to our floor, and then the door at the end of the hall opening and closing. We weren't sure who it was, but other people had keys to the building, so it wasn't that strange at first, although it was weird that anybody would be coming up at around three in the morning. Our building is separate from the main hospital, and it's a small facility, so there's not a lot of people around at night anyway. We kept talking, expecting to see someone walk by the room or have someone say something, but nothing. After a minute or two, I poked my head out and looked down the hall. No one was there. We didn't hear any footsteps once the door had opened and closed. After a minute or so, we went down the stairs and looked out into the parking lot and out the door. No tire tracks, no shoe prints, and like I said, it was snowing. We went to the other door, and none were there either. It definitely creeped us both out. The building was old and had been a lot of different things, serving mostly hospital functions. As far as I know, though, no patient rooms were ever there. Certainly people die in the ambulances, and in the hospital, but I don't know of any other deaths in the building. I mentioned it to some of my co-workers the next day, and they said that they had heard doors slamming, and one medic who used to be there swore that a locked door on the sleeping room flew open in the middle of the night when he was there alone. As far as anything with patients goes, I don't think I ever saw anything paranormal. Death is a process, and weird things can definitely happen during it, so it can be hard to draw the exact line between normal and paranormal, I suppose. Just a little info on where I lived in Japan. I lived on a small island south of mainland Japan called Okinawa. My dad is in the military, and the entire island is haunted, mainly the military bases, including the housing. I'm only going to mention the strange encounters that I personally had, but my entire family has stories from our time there. One night around 2-3 to three in the morning, I had randomly woken up on the couch. My brother and I often fell asleep in the living room on weekends. It was pitch black. My phone had died. I couldn't find the remote, and I was terrified. I sat in the darkness for a bit, waiting for my phone to charge. I heard this loud thud, like something plastic had been dropped from the ceiling, but I could never identify the source. Another thing that happened was one of the most terrifying things. My parents and brother were going out. My parents were shopping and my brother was visiting friends, meaning that I would be home alone. Before they left, I would hear the chairs at the table move around. We had faux wood floors. I went downstairs to check it out, but everything was the same, so I brushed it off like it was nothing. Then I was sitting on the couch and I had this really strange feeling that something just wasn't right. I looked into the doorway to our kitchen. You can see the laundry room and the recycling bins from there. And a figure moved from the laundry room to the doorway three times. I was scared out of my mind. I started crying and I called my friend because my parents weren't answering. Then, about ten feet in front of me, 
I see a figure with no legs glide across the room and disappear. Finally, I still can't explain how this one happened. I was in my room and my bed was pushed against the wall. I had a window on this wall and I had a shelf two to three feet above my headboard. On this shelf, I had a lot of knickknacks, like figurines and stuff. But I also had this cross stitch that my mom did when she was little, sitting on the shelf, being held up by two Funko Pop figurines. Thursday morning at around 3 to 4 a.m., I heard this loud bang that woke me up. It was loud enough to wake up my mom as well. She came into my room and asked what the noise was from, and I shrugged my shoulders and went back to sleep. That morning, I found out that it was the cross stitch from my shelf. It had slammed against my wall at the end of my bed. It didn't fall because the Funko figurines were still standing and it would have hit my head. Cryptozoology is the study of unknown animals, along with plants, that have not yet been accepted by science to exist or be real. In some cases, cryptozoologists research accounts involving large carnivorous plants, consuming animals, and even human beings. What would you do if you encountered a tree starving for human blood, spawned not from nature, but by a supernatural force? In Japan, legends warn of such a vampiric plant, called the Juboko. Japanese folklore labeled demons, monsters, spirits, and other malevolent forces as yokai. A few of these supernatural entities resulted in a human, animal, or even a household transforming after experiencing some traumatic or violent event. Not surprising to discover legends about plants manifesting into yokai that feed upon humans, like the jiboko. In myth, this creature was once a tree within a battlefield, whose roots absorbed vast amounts of blood soaked in from the soil, from dead warriors giving birth to a monster. Jiboko appears as any other ordinary tree in the forest, waiting for an unsuspecting victim. Only the few observant may be warned to the unusual jagged branches or the several bones poking through the roots. Many fail to notice these features and fall victim to the tree once close enough. The branches would grab the prey and hoist them up the center of the tree. The victim would have their veins and arteries stabbed by the branches as the jiboko sucks out all the blood. The corpse would either remain hanging or lowered to the ground for animals and other scavengers to feed upon until bones were littered around the roots. Often, Jiboko thirsts for human blood, but will consume large animals when people, but will consume large animals when people are not available. Many Japanese legends of yokai will refer to ways of defeating them. Jiboko may be a demon but it still has the same vulnerabilities of a plant. Some stories told of chopping the tree down while fighting off its branches or setting fire to it until ashes remained. Just to note though, myths do mention a juboko branch can heal wounds and cure ailments. While on vacation in Japan last year, I stayed at an Airbnb near the Daigo Shrine in Kyoto, Japan. On my last night in town, I come back to my Airbnb at about 11.40 p.m. on a Monday night. Mind you, I had no alcohol or drugs in my system when this happened, and I was wide awake. The walkway to the shrine you have to walk through to and from the Airbnb was about three city blocks long by two blocks going both sides. 
As the layout goes, there were ditches at the foot of the walls, followed by a row of plants alternating all the way down. Then, a walkway in the middle, with a museum on the right, and a whole shrine and palace at the fork. I walk into the walkway of the shrine, and I ask myself this question. Why are there two kids hopping a wall? I saw these two little figures hop the wall to my right, and I paused to watch what was happening. As both get down, they run across the path, and they run all the way to the end of the path by the fork, and wait there while I was walking single file. They stand there for a few minutes. I walk a little closer because that was the way to my Airbnb. I make eye contact with these things. They were about three to four feet tall, very slim but proportionate, with a bigger head and pointed ears. They were as white as snow. Their eyes were about as big as our eye sockets, but completely black. Normally you can tell if someone is wearing clothes in a small distance, and I was only about 15 to 20 yards from them, but they had no sign of clothing. After making eye contact, both of them go running behind the corner that I had to turn. You could also see their shadows on the corner behind them, but I slowed down to give these things space because I was freaking out a little at that point. As I turned the corner, they were gone. But as I was walking back to my Airbnb, I sensed that I was being followed. I couldn't hear or see anything, but I know they were there. My mom has worked in the same nursing home for the past 20 years and has had a few strange experiences. She wanted me to tell her story because we both find her story interesting and creepy. And we wondered if anybody else has experienced number four in particular. So the home that she works in has two floors, a basement and an attic. Long hallways connect to the residents' rooms, sharply branching left and right at the end. And at the other end is the kitchen and dining room. For reference, at the end of the hallway to the right is the storage and cleaning supply area. No resident rooms are on that side. Number one. One night, my mom was working late and had to go get something from the supply cupboard. She turned the corner from the kitchen to head up the long hallway. She has MS, so she has to be careful walking so she tends to look at the floor while doing so. As she's walking, she glances up and sees what looks like the bottom of an old Victorian red dress going around the corner to the right, near the floor and moving rather quickly. Obviously, sometimes residents can wander at night, but none of them could turn around the corner that quickly. She continues up to check anyway, though, because you never know. Lo and behold, no one is there. The only three doors down there are still locked. I don't think she got the supplies she needed. Instead, she just noped out of there. Number two. It was Christmas time, and my mom was to go up to the attic and get the Christmas napkins and other items down. None of the staff liked going up there because there's always been an eerie feeling. They usually go up in pairs. My mom took me up there when I was a teenager, and I can confirm, it has a creepy vibe. But for whatever reason, she had to go up by herself this time. As you can imagine, the attic is rather large. At the opposite end from the elevator is where all the junk that they don't use gets put, and nobody really goes that far over. So my mom's been up there for about five minutes, gathering whatever she needed, when she hears a rustling behind her. She stopped and paid attention for a second, when all of a sudden, there's a loud bang from behind the junk, with no explanation and no apparent source. Again, she was out of there. Number three is more of an ongoing incident. She hears footsteps behind her all the time. She'll turn around, and nobody and nothing is there or anywhere near her. And finally, there's number four. 
I don't know how much of a coincidence this is, but whenever the residents pass away, it's always in threes. One will pass and then everybody's like, oh no, two more are gonna go. And they always do. Then nobody will die for weeks or months. Then as soon as one gets poorly and passes, so do another two. It's really strange. My mom tells me most of the staff have had some weird experiences, but I don't know their stories. Has anyone else heard of this with the residents passing in threes? I would really like to know if anyone else has this experience going on, and so would my mom. So I'm an RN. I was on evening shift several years ago on a GI surgical unit and was assigned to a new patient. I got him settled in and such and then went off shift. I went home and went to bed. That night I clearly dreamed that he died. In my dream he made an awful choking noise. Agonal gasp, I think it's called. And I knew he was gone. There were two other people in the room in my dream, though I couldn't clearly see their faces or identify them. Back on shift the next day, I learned that sure enough, he had died during the night. I now work in a community health unit in an economically depressed area. Through the generous donations of a local foundation, we have the ability to give away brand new infant car seats to families in need. A few years ago, I had a favorite family that I had been working with for several months, they had some challenges to get through, but we were working really hard and making good progress. They had a nine-month-old baby who had recently outgrown his car seat. Such a handsome little man. So, of course, we were able to get them a new seat. I showed his parents how to fit him into it properly and tighten the straps. As I was doing this, I had this absolutely gut-wrenching feeling. I kept encouraging the mom to get those straps tight enough. I watched his dad carry him and his new seat out to the car just shaking my head and feeling that it was all wrong. A few weeks later, Mr. Hansom and his dad were killed in a car crash. I don't know for sure, but I feel like he died in the seat that I gave him. I know it's not my fault, it just sucks. Those are two patients and two stories that will always stick with me. I've had lots of patients die over the years and I don't always get premonitions. It's pretty hit and miss with me, but those are experiences I'm not soon to forget. I'm not a medical professional myself, but I did spend a lot of time in a hospice house last year, and I want to relate something one of the nurses told me. I was there with my brother, who had driven overnight to be with our mom during her last days. She was still pretty lucid at that point, and I want to add, my mom died of colon cancer, so there was no dementia or anything like that that would have mentally impaired her. We were just sitting with her, talking quietly, even laughing a little bit with her. We were all in pretty okay spirits considering the circumstances. Suddenly, she began slowly counting. One, two, three, and pointing her finger to a different spot in the room with each number. We of course asked her what she was doing, and a nurse came into the room about that time. My mom had gotten up to 12 by that point. We asked her again, what are you doing? And I will never forget her response. There are just, there are just so many people here. How did you and your brother get so many people here? And I know them all. She actually looked so happy when she said that, and so pleased, as if we had planned some kind of party for her. We just kind of smiled and nodded, because the only people there were my brother, myself, and the nurse. Later that day, the nurse took us aside, and said that this is a very common occurrence in hospice rooms. The patient sees loved ones, usually all deceased, crowded around to their bedside. She said, sometimes the family members and the staff see them too.
When many, many moons ago, I was well enough to aspire to be a nurse, I was in my first semester of clinicals on, of all wards, palliative care. At my school, we would go on Wednesday and meet the patient, find out about them, and if they had family, we would meet them too. Because of privacy concerns, I will be as minimally informative about identifiable data as possible, but my first patient was under the age of four with terminal cancer and was on their last leg. The family was warm and welcoming, and the kid was awesome. Despite being so ill, that kid was so happy. It was almost an instant big brother, little sibling bond. Thursdays were reserved for book work and research on the diagnosis and possible interventions, but I went back for a second visit on Thursday, just because. Fridays, that semester at least, were actual clinical service days from 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. I arrived on the ward at 6.30, just to get ready, zen out a little bit, and prepare myself for anything that I could think of that I might need to do that day. When I walked in, I noticed the nurses were acting a little bit mopey. A few looked like they'd been crying. And it hit me, like someone sucker punched me right in the gut. The little one had passed on. My fears were right. My instructor allowed me to spend time with the family as they said goodbye. And when they stepped out, I helped prepare the little body for transport to the morgue. There was an odd feeling in the room after the parents and family left, and I swear I heard a giggle. To this day, when I'm having a bad day, I can still hear an adorable, giggly, tiny voice say, No sad, I okay, which is what the little one kept telling their mother when she slipped up and had a little cry. It helped stop me from quitting the program then and there on the spot. Whether it's a little guardian angel trying to cheer me up, or just some figment of my subconscious mind trying to cheer myself up, it's an awesome thing. I know what I think it is, but I'm not one to be objective about it because of the experience. That's as close as I got to actual hospice care, but it really helped change my ideas about the process of death and how we respond to people experiencing it. In all the interactions, it was about being alive and making memories instead of sulking and feeling bad, and that's how I approach anybody who's at death's door now. I try to make good memories and live with them while I still can, and while they still can, but never condescendingly or as a means of placating anybody. It's genuine, as it should be. My adventure in Somerset County, known for its picturesque landscapes and historical sites, took an unexpected turn when I stumbled upon the remnants of an old forgotten village. I was on a hiking trip, seeking to explore the lesser known trails, and this discovery piqued my curiosity. The village, hidden deep in the woods, was a ghostly sight. Overgrown vegetation had reclaimed the crumbling structures. It was evident that no one had lived here for a very long time. Intrigued, I decided to camp nearby for the night, hoping to delve deeper into the village's history the next day. As night fell, the woods took on a different character. The once tranquil surroundings now seemed eerily silent. However, as I settled into my tent, an unexpected sound broke the stillness, the distant murmur of voices and the clatter of activity. It sounded like a bustling community, a stark contrast to the desolation I had seen. At first, I thought I might not be alone, like in a natural way, like maybe other hikers were exploring the area. But as I cautiously stepped out of my tent, the sounds grew clearer, and it became apparent that they were emanating from the old village itself. I walked toward the village, my flashlight piercing the darkness. The closer I got, the louder the sounds became. I could hear what seemed like snippets of conversations, laughter, the clinking of glasses, and even the faint melody of music, as if the village had come alive with the echoes of the past. But the village was just as I had left it, abandoned with no sign of human presence. The buildings stood silent and empty, contradicting the lively noises that filled the air. It was as if I was listening to an audio recording of the village, a reenactment of its long-lost daily life. I stood there, 
in the middle of this commotion, trying to make sense of what was happening. It was an overwhelming sensation, feeling surrounded by an invisible crowd, hearing the life that once thrived in this now forsaken place. Later, I learned that the village had been abandoned over a century ago, following a series of misfortunes that led to its decline. The locals often spoke of it, saying that it was haunted by the spirits of its former inhabitants. That night, as I lay in my tent, the sounds gradually faded with the coming of dawn. In the morning, the village was once again just a cluster of dilapidated buildings. I worked for Starbucks for about two years in two different locations between the years 2017 and 2019. The one that I transferred to was the new one in my town, which I was training for in the next town over. They had torn down an older cafe that Starbucks replaced. I have a friend who worked at the cafe and said that they only experienced some minor happenings of the paranormal. Well, this is what happened to myself and a fellow co-worker when we were closing one night. It was a normal night after closing and I was doing the floors and cleaning the bathrooms. After closing, someone was still inside one of the bathrooms. I knocked and I let them know that we were closed. The person said, okay, and I heard them wash their hands in the sink. This is a single room bathroom, no stalls. The locks we used were the same type used in hospitals, being true locks, that you cannot accidentally lock behind yourself when leaving. Also, there is a motion-censored light that turns off after 15 minutes of no movement. My shift supervisor cannot do the drawers and registers with a customer still inside of the building. So, after another 20 minutes, I knocked once more and asked if they were okay. I hear a man's voice say, yes, then grunts, many grunts, followed with many bangs, the sink turning on and off. I live in a small town and there are many people who use substances in bathrooms. Prior to this incident, somebody was banging on the walls and shooting up within the bathroom. Police were contacted and he was taken out. So with that having happened before, we thought that was the same thing that was happening now. We call the police and the station is right next door to our Starbucks. We are behind the station. They never came because it was a busy night. The motion censored light is still on after an hour. More bangs, the sink being on and off. Again, I knock and let the person know that the police have been notified. More grunting. There's a key to unlock the door, but I was 18 at the time. I was not going to put my coworkers at risk. My coworkers and I try to just keep closing, but still be as alert as possible that this person was still making noise and sounded like they were in distress. We call the police again after about just under an hour of waiting for them. The operator tells us that we'll have to be patient and wait it out. I'm watching the light under the door until after a while it goes off. No movement for 15 minutes. My shift calls my general manager and she says to contact 911 for an unresponsive unit because the person could have died from drugs in that bathroom while we were waiting. Next thing that happens, firefighters come in with EMTs. Everyone can hear the man grunt once. The EMT asked if he was okay. The EMT then told him that they were opening the door. After another moment, the EMT did just that, opened the door, and nobody was inside. He looks at us and we look at him. Everyone is just frozen. We tried to collect ourselves, but we were all shocked. There's no vent in the ceiling. The trash can is big, but not big enough to hold a person. And there was no way for us to not see this person leave, especially when we all just heard him grunt seconds before the door was opened. My coworkers that worked with me that night quit shortly after this, as did I. While I worked there, I had the ice bucket thrown at me, food thrown at me, 
items appear across the store when they would never by law be there in the first place. Only a small handful of the original workers from when that location had opened ended up staying. My manager still works there and she is convinced that there's something there as well. I was a certified nursing assistant working third shift at an end-of-life senior care facility in Upper Michigan. The hours were usually quiet as everybody was in bed or heading there and meals were over. The overnight job entailed lots of cleaning, mopping, dusting, and prepping for breakfast at 8 a.m., as well as answering night calls or being on death watch every 15 minutes. Those were the worst, as you knew that death was coming soon. One resident was close, but could linger for days, the doctor had said. People said and did the oddest things at those last gasps, too. Needless to say, it was not an easy job. But the pay sucked equally as well. Small town blues for job prospects. Watching other people's family members die is not for the faint of heart. It's a constant reminder of life's worst parts and the limited time we've been given. One of my favorite co-workers had a great upbeat attitude. Her name was Val, and I shared this night shift with her. We knew our preferred tasks and set about them happily, chatting to each other in the dining room and getting it ready for breakfast. Val needed to use one of the nearby employee toilets for an extended stay, so I proceeded to mop the opposite hallway facing the nurse's station and the bathroom where Val was. I mopped backwards, pulling rather than pushing so that I don't leave footprints. Naturally, I can't see where the carpet begins and where I need to dip my mop and turn direction. The only way I know I'm there is when my shoe heel hits the edge. I can mindlessly do this job while looking around the hallway. I was in the process of dipping and squishing my mop when a form caught my eye in the hallway arch entrance to the doors that lead to both the nurse's station and opposite the bathroom where Val was. I thought it was her returning back to the floor, but nope. What I saw gave me a great open mouth, silent screamed pause. Peeking and stretching out across part of the hallway ceiling, maybe 15 feet long into the main taller hallway where I stood, was a dark human shadow form, smoky and eyeless. It stayed there for maybe two to four seconds, and then, zip, it shot back into the hallway. I stood there, scared, silent, and immobile. As I heard the bathroom door open, Val scream, and then the door slamming again. I heard her call my name through the closed door and slowly crept to the hallway to see nothing there but the doors to the nurse's station, the bathroom, and now the break room across from the utility closet where the cleaning supplies lived. The hallway was clear. I called out Val's name from outside the door, knocking too. She asked in a squeaky voice, is it gone? I responded, yes, what did you see? Because I saw something, now get out here now. Don't leave me alone with that. Val came out and grabbed me in a hug so hard that I knew how scared she was. Val was shaking. She said that she opened the bathroom door, and she should have been able to see the nurse's station's open door and part of the hallway wall. But what she saw blocked the door and most of the wall. That thing was huge. It filled the wall and was smoky black. She didn't see a top or a face shape to it but it blocked her exit like a smoky haze right against the door, leaking in. She slammed the door fast and screamed my name. We worked side by side the rest of our shift, never leaving each other's sight until it was time to leave. The morning shift supervisor wondered why we both clocked out and bolted in a huge hurry that day. Val told her about it later in a text message, saying that she was taking a day off. I'm not sure if it was a reaper we saw, but right after we clocked out, a resident died.
So it's 1982, and Ronald Reagan is turning the U.S. Navy from 400 ships into 600 ships because of the Soviet Union. So the Navy takes a lot of old ships that they mothballed in Bremerton, Washington, and tow them over to Tacoma to refurbish them and bring them back into service. I'm sure they did this everywhere they had old Navy ships. So I get a job as a security guard with a company being contracted with Tacoma Boat who have a huge contract with the U.S. Navy. I can't remember the name of the ship, but it was an electronic warfare ship, which means I have no idea what it was for. Probably a spy ship that listened in on Soviet ships and submarines, but I'm just guessing. I wasn't from the Navy. I was a civilian security guard with eight hours of security training under my belt, assigned to walk the entire ship every couple of hours. Me and another guy, and the other guy was crazier than a squirrel on meth, but hey, when you're paying your guards three fifteen dollars per hour, you take what you can get. We took turns walking the ship, as we called it, had to go all over to make sure that nobody was there. The workers got there at 6am and left by 7pm. Lots of expensive tools lying around, as well as paintbrushes paint guns, sanders, all kinds of things that one could sell if you ripped them off. So that's what we were for. Nobody was supposed to be on the ship at all, except for me and the hyperactive mental fellow security guard. We took turns. I would walk the ship one hour, and he would walk it the next. Then me the next, and so on and so forth until our shift was over at 6 a.m. The ship appeared to be pretty much gutted of just about all of its electronic equipment. I was told that all of the old equipment was being replaced with new, but they had to paint it all inside and out first, and they were still in the painting phase. Also, they were working on the engines below, hence all the tools that I saw in the engine room. I worked there maybe five days at most, not even that. It was a long time ago. I would hear voices. I'd be in one room and voices would come from the corridor. I'd be in the corridor and voices would come from a room. Just the voices of men, like they were talking to each other. I'd go into the corridor when I heard the voices and I'd see nobody and hear nothing. Then the voices would come from a certain room. I'd rush in there and, again, nobody there. Silence. I concluded that there were radios on the ship and some kind of PA system that I wasn't familiar with. I told the other guard about the voices. He said, man, that's wild. I mean, you know, I don't know. He was either crazy or high and I couldn't tell which. I asked him if he was playing a joke on me and he laughed and denied it. I still wasn't sure because he looked pretty crazy. This was long before drug testing. The last night I was there, same thing, the voices all over the place. One of the mechanics who worked on the engine came in early at about 5 p.m. and was sipping coffee in our guard room, which was part of a trailer. I said, I'm hearing those voices again all over the ship. Must be some kind of radio. The mechanic swallowed his coffee hard and shook his head. Nope, no radios on this ship. Took them all out. They're going to install new ones, but... They're not here yet. I was stunned. I said, are you sure? He took another sip of coffee and nodded yes. I didn't go back. Today, I kind of regret not going back and trying to communicate with the entities on that ship. The hospital in which I worked did not do pediatrics, but I did work nights and I was a night float, so I ran around the entire facility all night long, helping out wherever I was needed. Our hospital began in 1863, so you can imagine how much it had grown over the years and how much death it had seen. We had everything from slamming doors to the sound of a phantom IV pole moving up one particular hallway toward the nurse's station. We had an elevator that ran seemingly at random throughout the entire night, with doors opening, then closing, before moving on to another random floor. We called the entity in the elevator Thomas, 
and we would all greet him when the elevator doors opened. There was an actual cold spot in the back right corner of that car. Every time I got squished into the corner while transferring somebody, I would apologize to Thomas for standing on him. He never seemed to mind. We had a whatever in one of the stairwells that would pound on the door and then rattle the heavy latch, startling whoever was staying in the next room. We called it the whatever too because we had no idea what it was. These were heavy metal fire doors, mind you, that didn't just rattle in a light stairwell breeze. The whatever would always pound, then rattle twice in a row. When the patient would inevitably ask about the noise, I would tell them that it was a wind turbine rattling up above on the roof. No reason to freak somebody out at 2 a.m. We had the 1915 era nurse in the long dress, floor length apron, and starched white cap forever making her rounds in the oldest part of the hospital. Patients used to see her all the time and would ask if they could talk to the really nice nurse again. I would tell them that I would try to find her, but she might be in another part of the hospital by now, which technically was true. We had the creepy telephone in an old break room that would ring, but there was only silence on the other end, every single time. But if you didn't answer that damned phone, something would pound on the break room door. But of course, nobody was ever there either. We had the room in the back corner in hospice oncology that no one liked to visit alone. It was dark and gloomy and so oppressive, and you got the feeling that you were being watched. The lights in that room never seemed to be bright enough. The maintenance guys told me about the disappearing black cat that they would see down in the tunnels. Call lights would go off in empty rooms. Disembodied voices and conversations could be heard and even a pair of legs and slippers and pajama pants could be seen shuffling down a hallway in Nero. Lots of stuff went on there. None of it was ever overly frightening or gave a bad vibe. It was just interesting, to me at least. Except maybe that room up in hospice. Screw that room. I used to work the graveyard shift in a nursing home in Texas, and there were three occasions where I saw what I consider to be shadow figures. Nothing overtly scary happened, but it's the only location I've been at where I've had personal paranormal experiences. Incident number one. Maybe a week or two before this occurred, a man passed away suddenly. After waking up and following his normal morning routine, he went from getting himself dressed and going for his daily walk to having one cup of coffee, and in the time it took him to ask for his second cup, and it being made for him, he had stopped breathing and was gone. During normal work duties, I saw a completely black head peek around a corner and then go back to being obscured by the walls, like a man peeked around the corner and then went back down the hall. There were never any noises associated with anybody leaving the room, or anybody walking down the hall, and when I went to investigate, there was nobody there. The man that suddenly passed away lived in a room down that hallway, and I've always felt that it was him, still being present. Incident number two. Working graveyard shift, we did some housekeeping duties, since lots of people slept through the night, and I guess they wanted to give us something to do. So I was dusting around the TV, and I saw a human shadow walk behind a couch reflected in the TV. Again, no sounds of a resident opening a door, and at this point, everybody was in their rooms, sleeping. I assumed it was my coworker, since I hadn't seen her in a little while. I figured she was doing some cleaning in another area. A few minutes later, while I was still dusting, she came out of the area where we do laundry. It was on the other side, so clearly it wasn't her. Again, there was no resident up, because the walk that I saw was completely fluid, and not one of the residents was physically able to walk like that. It was like somebody in their 20s with no physical difficulties, just casually walking. And again, there was no color reflected in the TV. It was a fully black walking shadow. That one did unsettle me a bit. In a third incident, there was a woman who we knew was passing away. Our duty was to keep her clean and as comfortable as we could while she was in the process of passing. 
That night, I saw through the window of the nurse's station a pure white shadow walk one way down the hall that the woman was living on, and then walk down the hall again in the first direction. To this day, I don't know why that figure was white when the first two figures I saw were black, but I like to think it was the woman's guardian angel or something like that, staying with her or waiting for her to pass and take her to the afterlife. After moving to Mississippi and getting jobs here, I haven't had any more paranormal experiences, so there must have just been a high level of energy at that place in Texas. It was a fairly new facility, so maybe in some way that had something to do with stirring up some energies. This happened in July of 2017. I was driving in Yamanashi to go to an old hotel in the countryside with my girlfriend for her birthday, which was the next day. We decided to go out at 11 p.m. to buy some alcohol and food at a local 7-Eleven, which was open all night, to celebrate her birthday right at midnight. Before going back to the hotel, I wanted to stop on a hill that is surrounded by a forest to see the stars and wish my girlfriend a happy birthday at midnight. I was slowly driving through the forest when I saw something floating above the road, about a meter from my car. It looked like a glowing orb, but it was so fast that I couldn't really make it out. It just passed the corner of my eyes. At first I thought my headlight shined on some spider webs, but the orb was above the car hood, and it vanished when it hit the windshield. I didn't want to scare my girlfriend, so I acted like nothing happened, and I kept driving until we exited the forest. I asked her then if she saw something in the forest, and I could tell by her voice and her face that she was as scared as I was. We decided to go back to our hotel straight away, and spend the rest of the night watching television to get our mind away from the scary thing that we had just encountered. I have no logical explanation for what we saw, even if I tried my hardest to make it rational. I'm okay with the idea that some Japanese forests have spirits, and with the idea that we may have seen one. My Nurse Was a Ghost by Reddit user LolaBunny3000 posted to r slash ghost stories. In 2020, at the beginning of the pandemic, I had just given birth. At this time, I could only have one other person in the room with me my entire stay at the hospital. Of course, my kid's father was there, but like the third day, he left to clean up our house and get everything prepared for me and the baby. I had gotten sick and had a c-section, so I had to stay for about four to five days. Well, while he was away, a nurse named Kelly said she would be helping me throughout the day and spending time with me, so I didn't feel so lonely while the father was gone. I couldn't really hold my baby due to me being sick and the pain from the c-section, so my nurses would come in every time that it was time to feed the baby. I noticed that when they came in, they never even acknowledged Kelly. She would go to the farthest part of the room and she would tell me, I'm just gonna get out of the way. Now she did tell me that she didn't specialize in what they did. She was just for comfort. So I didn't question anything. The entire day, she was so helpful and encouraging to me. I really believe that I would have broken down if she wasn't there with me. She was such a sweetheart. Well, after about five or six hours, she told me she had to leave and that she would come and visit me before her shift was over to see how I was doing. She hugged me and blew a kiss at my baby and walked out of the room. Later that night, the kid's father came back and he was very upset. He had told me some stuff happened with his mom and that he was sorry he took so long. I was upset, but I told him that a nurse named Kelly had kept me company. As I'm telling him about her, the nurse who was changing my sheets said, who's Kelly? I explained, 
and she said that nobody named Kelly was in my room or working that day. So I instantly thought about those women who would pretend to be nurses and kidnap children. But my nurse told me I was probably just hallucinating, and she told my doctor. I talked to my doctor, and he said the same thing. Well, a couple of hours later, a nurse that I didn't recognize came into my room and said, I know this might sound crazy, but everyone on the floor is talking about you seeing Kelly. I said, yeah, she was in here with me for like seven hours today. She helped out a lot. We're smiling and laughing while I'm telling her about Kelly and how sweet and funny she was. Then she pulled up her phone and showed me pictures of her and Kelly that looked to be maybe early 2000s. I was smiling because clearly I wasn't hallucinating. Then she sat down and told me that Kelly had died over 10 years prior from DV with her boyfriend. I wasn't too shocked because my entire life I have been dealing with the paranormal, but I got chills because I never had an encounter this deep. The lady gave me a hug and started crying and said, now I know Kelly's okay. Since that day, I've always wondered why Kelly came into my room to help me. I kind of wish I could see her again. I worked as an EMT for one of the busiest cities when it comes to 911. It was a beautiful summer day and everyone was at the beach enjoying the sun. Tones drop and we get to our rig to see that we're responding to a potential infant drowning. We get to the scene and find PD performing CPR. We take over and start doing everything we can. I get this weird feeling to look up mid compression and I see the little girl that I'm performing CPR on standing there three feet away from me. She doesn't say anything, but I get a feeling, a calmness, one that tells me everything is going to be okay. We get pulses back for a minute, then lose them. By that time, the fire engine shows up and we load and go. Fire driving the rig, my partner, a fire medic, and I in the back doing everything we can to save this girl. We get to Children's Hospital and all three of us are too invested at this point to just offload and go so we stay and fight the battle with the ER team. It was the moment I chose to leave EMS. We lost her. My heart sank. How could I get a fleeting feeling of hope and then lose her? I took it personally to deliver the news to her parents. I broke down and cried with them, holding them and telling them I was sorry. I get back to the rig after what seems like an eternity, and in the back, in the airway seat, I see the little girl just sitting and smiling. I don't know, I got that calmness all over again, like she was telling me it was okay. Fast forward about a year. I will admit that I have had paranormal activity happen around me in my personal life, like seeing the same ghost since I was 10, seeing backpacks fly off of countertops, water glasses full being thrown to the ground when there's no breeze, but this whole past year, whenever I'm stressed or I need calmness, she comes and shows up and calms me. I still deal with the fact that I couldn't save her. She was my hardest no save, but I think I gained a guardian angel in her no matter how crazy that might sound. Ghost in the Mirror. So let me tell you about this crazy thing that happened to me. I've always been into spooky stuff, but I never expected to actually experience anything paranormal. It was just a regular night and I was brushing my teeth before bed. I live alone, so imagine my shock when I looked up into the bathroom mirror and saw someone standing behind me. I spun around, but there was no one there. When I looked back at the mirror, the figure was still there, staring right at me. It was this blurry, shadowy figure, 
kind of like an outline of a person. It was really creepy. I rubbed my eyes, thinking I was just tired or something, but the figure in the mirror didn't go away. It just kept staring, and I swear it felt like it was looking right into my soul. I was freaking out, so I left the bathroom and tried to convince myself that it was just my imagination. But this is the weird part. The next morning, I mentioned it to my neighbor, and she kind of went pale. She told me that the previous tenant of my apartment used to say the same thing, that they saw reflections in the mirror that didn't belong there, and that she'd always written them off. But now that two people had said the same thing, I don't know what to believe, but I can tell you this. I avoid looking into that mirror at all costs, just in case. The Shadow Figures of Penobscot Forest My journey into the depths of Penobscot County's dense forest was driven by a desire to disconnect and immerse myself in nature's tranquility. This vast woodland, steeped in history and folklore, seemed the perfect escape. However, what I encountered there was far from peaceful. The first few days were uneventful, filled with the typical sounds and sights of a forest. It was on the fourth day, as dusk settled, that I first noticed something peculiar. In the dimming light, I saw what appeared to be shadowy figures standing at a distance. They were human-like in shape, but their features were indistinct, blurred as if made of smoke or mist. Initially, I rationalized these sightings as tricks of light or figments of my imagination. But as I continued my trek, these shadowy apparitions became a constant presence. They always appeared at the edge of my vision, watching me from a distance, never approaching, yet always there. Their movements were unlike anything I'd ever seen, fluid and unnatural, as if they were gliding through the trees. The forest, which had once felt welcoming, now seemed imbued with a sense of foreboding. I felt as though I was being observed, evaluated by unseen guardians of ancient secrets. One evening, as I sat by my campfire, the forest around me fell into an oppressive silence. The air grew unnaturally still, and a chill ran down my spine. I sensed a presence nearby, and turning, I caught a clear view of one of the figures. It stood at the edge of the clearing, its dark form almost blending into the night, save for the faint outline that made it visible. Our gaze, if you can call it that, met, and in that moment I felt an overwhelming sense of age-old wisdom and sorrow. It was as if this entity was a custodian of the forest, a keeper of stories long forgotten by the modern world. I didn't sleep that night. The sense of being watched was inescapable. As dawn broke, the figures vanished, melting away with the morning mist. I packed up my gear, my curiosity now replaced by a deep-seated unease. Back in civilization, I researched the history of Penobscot County and found tales of ancient spirits and guardians, entities believed by indigenous cultures to protect sacred lands. The descriptions matched what I had seen, and the stories spoke of respect and reverence toward these spirits. All in all, I walked away with a profound respect for the mysteries of nature and a reminder that there are aspects of this world that remain far beyond our understanding, and maybe that's where the magic is. Either way, I don't think I'll have a problem going back to those woods. The experience was strange and unsettling, but I never felt threatened, and in a way, I feel called to return. The Vanishing Diner I've always been a skeptic when it comes to anything paranormal or unexplainable. I prefer logic and reason to explain the world around me. 
But something happened last summer that shook my very understanding of reality. Something I can't dismiss or rationalize away. I still get chills thinking about it. I was on a road trip across the country. Just me and the open road. It was liberating, feeling the wind in my hair and not having a care in the world. One evening, as the sun was setting, I found myself driving through a rural area in Kansas. I hadn't eaten since breakfast, and my stomach was growling loudly. That's when I saw it, a quaint little diner right off the highway, its neon sign buzzing invitingly in the twilight. The place was called Rosie's Diner, and it looked like it was from another era, with its classic 50s architecture and old-fashioned decor. I parked my car and walked in. The bell above the door chimed cheerfully. The interior was cozy with checkered flooring, red vinyl booths, and a jukebox in the corner playing some soft rock and roll. I was greeted by a waitress who I presumed was Rosie. She was an older woman with a warm smile and a friendly demeanor. She led me to a booth and handed me a menu. I ordered a burger and a milkshake, classic diner fare. As I waited for my food, I chatted with Rosie. She told me that she'd been running the diner for decades, ever since her husband passed away. She spoke fondly of the regulars and the sense of community the diner brought. The food was delicious and I was feeling content and relaxed. I paid for my meal, thanked Rosie, and promised to come back if I ever passed through again. She waved goodbye as I left, and the bell chimed again. The next day, as I continued my journey, I couldn't stop thinking about Rosie's diner. It was such a charming place, a hidden gem in the middle of nowhere. On a whim, I decided I wanted to write a review for it online to maybe help other travelers find it. But when I searched for Rosie's diner, nothing came up. No website, no reviews, no mention of it anywhere. I thought maybe I had the name wrong, but I was certain it was Rosie's. I retraced my route on the map, determined to find it again. I drove back the way I came, my eyes peeled for the familiar neon sign, but there was nothing. No sign of any diner, no building, nothing but empty fields stretching out on either side of the highway. I stopped at a gas station nearby and asked about Rosie's diner. The attendant looked at me like I was crazy. He said he'd lived in the area his whole life and there had never been a diner around there. Confused and a bit unnerved, I got back in my car and drove off. I kept thinking there must be some mistake, some logical explanation. But deep down, I knew what I experienced. I had been to that diner. I had talked to Rosie. I had eaten the food, yet, it was as if it never existed. It's been months since that trip, and I still can't make sense of what happened. It haunts me, this unexplainable mystery. Was it a glitch in reality, a figment of my imagination, or something else entirely? I don't have any answers, only questions that linger in my mind, echoing like the distant chime of that diner's bell. My friend came to me with this story yesterday. She works at a nursing home, often at night. Just the other night, someone called 911 from inside the home. The staff did not know that this occurred until the EMT arrived. They relayed the information that an elderly woman had called. She said that she was scared because nobody was around and she couldn't find the staff, also adding that she felt lost and scared which they assumed to be a sign of her dementia. After investigating all of the cameras around the facility, not a single soul was awake at this time of night. It was around 2 a.m. They tracked the phone call. When they did, they traced it to a phone which was off the hook, in a room of a woman who had passed away around a week earlier and had a close personal connection with my friend. She spooked, to say the least, 
and it's awfully sad that this soul is apparently stuck in some sort of limbo. Back in 2017, we went on a Caribbean cruise, and our ship was called the Harmony of the Seas. My whole family slept in the same cabin. My little sister and I shared a bunk bed which could be separated from the rest of the room by a curtain. It was our first night, and I woke up at 4.27 a.m. I thought my sister was looking at me from the corner of the curtain, so at first I was like, what are you doing? but it didn't take long before I realized that it was not my sister. I had no clue who or what was watching me. So I turned on my light as fast as I could, but it was gone. I considered staying up until somebody would wake up, but I was so jet lagged that I just fell back asleep again. The next night, the exact same thing happened. Someone with long, dark hair was staring at me. I was like, oh no, not this again. And just like the night before, I turned my light on as fast as I could, and it disappeared. I checked the time on my phone, and again it was 4.27. Needless to say, I kept my little light on for the rest of the cruise, and thankfully I didn't see her again. I suppose you could say I was having sleep paralysis, but I don't know how I would have been able to move that fast if that was the case. I don't know if anybody else has had an experience like this on the same ship or in that region, or maybe there's some kind of tragedy there on that ship that would have resulted in a ghost, but if you know anything, let me know. I work at a hospital and I'm constantly in the ER visiting with patients. There was one day that I was rushing down the hall in phase two, which wasn't opened yet because it was around nine and that phase doesn't get staffed until 10. I was trying to get to a meeting and as I passed the last room before getting to a door that only employees have badge access to, I saw an older man in a gown there who said hello and waved. I was confused as to why he was in there so I doubled back to excuse my rushing and see if he was lost or if he needed help to his room. When I got there though, there was nobody there. It's a long hallway and all of the other doors were shut. There's no way that he could have made it to the other end and around the corner in the three seconds it took for me to turn around and look into the room. I shrugged it off and went to my meeting. A few hours later when I was coming back through the employee door, I glanced over there and there were several techs trying to work on something that at the time I couldn't see. One of the nurses told me that they had to unplug all of the equipment because all of the alarms would not stop going off, even though the machines were off. She thought that something caused an error because they kept randomly going off on the night shift nurse after the man in there passed away. At that point, I got goosebumps, and to this day I get creeped out when I walk down that hallway alone. I've recently started a new job in a memory care facility. Typically, the hours are 3 p.m. to 11 p.m. Last night, I worked a double, 3 p.m. to 7 a.m., and I had a weird experience with a patient. It began when putting her to bed. She began staring into a corner of the room, completely unresponsive to me. After numerous attempts, she came to and screamed, the devil is in my room. This occurred at 7 p.m. As a healthcare professional, I brushed it off as her Alzheimer's. Two hours pass and I hear a door down the hallway slam. All of the patients are in the living room with me, but that particular one. I went down the hall and found her door wide open. When I went in, her wheelchair was flipped over. She was sitting on the edge of the bed, staring at the corner, 
once again whispering, The devil, the devil, the devil. I get her situated and I let it go. Fast forward to 3 a.m. I hear this blood-curdling scream coming from the hallway. I run straight to her room. She was standing on her bed, staring at the ceiling, chanting. In French. The weird thing? This woman can't stand without support from the nursing staff. Not even a little. It creeped me out pretty badly, and I have completely refused working third shift because of it. She's been completely normal since that incident. Watching the cameras, you can see the slammed doors and hear weird noises, and it's clear that nobody is around to do it. Has anybody experienced anything similar in a medical facility? It's a first for me, but I'm interested in other similar stories. This happened when I was 14, and I'm 21 now. I lived with my parents in a small, three-bedroom townhouse. I remember not being able to sleep the night we moved in, basically laying there, staring at the ceiling for ages. My closet and wardrobe were made of a sliding glass mirror, which faced to the side of my bed. Being unable to sleep, I rolled over and stared at the mirror, and then... My heart sank, and I froze. In the reflection of the mirror, I saw a hooded figure behind me, walking toward me. It looked to be about six feet tall, and basically resembled the stereotypical Grim Reaper type of character. I freaked out and turned around, but there was nothing there. I ran out of the room, crying to my parents. I knew that they wouldn't believe me, so I just said that I had a bad dream but I know for a fact that I was not asleep at all. I've had sleep paralysis many times, and this wasn't that either, so I know it was real. A couple of years later, I told my dad about what happened. He told me that when my brother-in-law's uncle came to visit, he's considered a man of healing in Papua New Guinea, he said he felt an odd presence and then blessed the home. This happened after my encounter, after hearing that, it convinced me that it definitely was an entity and it wasn't my imagination. Since then, I've had no further experiences. First and foremost, I have never experienced anything supernatural in my entire life, but I do have friends who have told me stories and have had paranormal experiences before. This is the first time for me. Anyway, I woke up this morning and went to the bathroom and turned on the light. I immediately noticed a set of handprints, both right hand, on the mirror, right at the top. Our mirror is pretty big, so someone would have had to get up on the counter to touch the top. The next thing that I noticed is that they were much smaller than my hand. In fact, at least half the size. I woke up my roommate and pulled her in there, and we both stood staring at them, confused more than anything. There are definitely child's handprints on my mirror. Neither of us touched the mirror, and they weren't there yesterday and neither of us are or have children. We're at a total loss. One of my friends died almost a year ago to the day, so this has been on my mind a lot lately. I flew out for her funeral and met up with a group of friends. Together, we drove to the town where she was to be interred. Because we're all poor college graduates, we took the cheap route and shared a hotel room. The ride over was honestly kind of terrifying. Toward the latter part of the trip, conveniently after nightfall, 
we ended up driving through unfamiliar rural roads that were entirely devoid of other traffic. At one point, we were super lost and caught in a really thick fog, something completely uncharacteristic of the area. My friends joked that it was her ghost just messing with us. When we finally reached the hotel, it was about 11 and we were exhausted. We were all standing around in the lobby waiting to get checked in and it was a bit of a process. And that's when I saw my dead friend in the mirror. She didn't look scary or dead or anything and she wasn't even looking at me. That's why I didn't immediately parse that it was weird. I looked at her for a second or two and looked back down. When I fully registered what I had seen, I looked back up, but of course, she was gone. Empty space where she had been and all of that. Telling the story now, it seems so cliche. She looked so normal looking, though. She wasn't doing any type of scary dead ghost thing. She was just chilling there in the lobby like the rest of us, kind of bored, looking toward the concierge desk. She was wearing this leather jacket she had that fit her really well. Her eye makeup was like it always was. I mean, she looked great. I remember she was wearing these tiny gold filigree earrings that I had gotten her for Christmas. I didn't tell anybody I was with what I had seen because I didn't want to upset them. I still haven't told them. I don't think she was appearing to me or anything. Like, we were friends, but I definitely wasn't the closest person to her of everybody who was there at the time. I know it's likely that I was just tired, and that she was on my mind, and that I imagined it. But I do want to believe that it was true. It was really comforting to see her there. She didn't die suddenly. We all knew that it was going to happen for quite some time. One of her fears was that we would all forget about her when she passed. I chose to believe that she was just following us to make sure we made it to her funeral. Now that I've told the story, I feel kind of stupid, I guess. I just wanted to tell somebody. I worked as a paramedic on an ambulance during the night shift. One morning, we received a medical call for a patient who was having difficulty breathing. Upon arrival, we entered the patient's home, which was one of the smallest homes I have ever seen. It was about 400 square feet total. You walked into the living room, which connects to a kitchen and then connects to the only bedroom. When we walked in, we saw the patient in the back of the room. During our assessment of her, the cops that were with us kept asking if somebody else was in the house because they said they thought they heard something. With the patient's size and the condition of the front porch, we decided to go out of the sliding door inside the patient's room. After getting the patient into the ambulance, I went back inside the home while the police left for another call after helping lift the patient. I was going in the back room to get our bags and turn off the lights, but when I entered the home, the lights were off. They had all been on just moments before, and it's not like the snow was bad enough to take down power lines in that amount of time. We checked later and no power had gone out anywhere else. I tried the lights to no avail. I thought it was weird, but I didn't think much of it. Then I was walking in the kitchen when I looked down to find our bags all piled up and zipped up. I then felt that there was something in the house. I grabbed the bags and ran out. I found out right after getting outside that my radio had died. It was fully charged when I walked in there. I had thought that the cops put the bags in the kitchen, but they were outside the home before us to help the patient. I was the last one out of that house, and our bags were opened up all the way because we had to get the patient various items from each bag. I have no explanation for how our bags got packed up and zipped up, and to this day, nobody has taken credit.
There's an old wives' tale about this stretch of road in Maine, Route 182, a.k.a. Blackswoods Road. It's home to Catherine, the ghost hitchhiker, and the devil truck. I am still shaken to my very core by the experience I had five years ago. The story of Catherine I won't really comment on. There are lots of accounts of that. They even made episodes on shows about it. But what I'm going to talk about is much darker. The Devil Truck. This truck isn't talked about much, except by old-timers at the gas station called Tideway. When they first told me about it, I didn't believe it. Boy, I wish I would've before I left the store that night. But anyway, I thought, great, old-timers telling me some BS because I just moved here. I should add that at this time, I was a fresh deputy with Waldo County. So I grabbed an orange juice out of the cooler because they didn't have the Gatorade I liked, told the old-timers I was gonna head home because I had a long day shift, paid for my drink, and left. Here's the creepy part. I live on 182. So I started driving home normally in my take-home vehicle. I pulled out of the gas station and sped off. I set the cruise control and the charger to 50 miles per hour and just started thinking about what I wanted for supper. About three miles after the gas station, a truck pulls out behind me. I didn't think much of it. Except that it was weird to see a 72 F100 out on the roads this late. Then out of nowhere, about 25 minutes after pulling out behind me, the truck rams the back of the cruiser, sending me sideways. I remember slamming into a tree and spinning back across the road into the guardrail that separates the road from Fox Pond. I instantly put on my blues so traffic would see me, since my headlights were facing right where the blind spot was on the road. I got out looking for the truck, thinking it had to be a problem with the truck. Surely somebody wouldn't try to kill a sheriff's deputy in Maine. There was no truck. There wasn't even a sign of a truck. I tried to call it in, but my car radio wouldn't work. Luckily, one of the old timers from the store was traveling home as well and stopped to help. What he said to me haunts me every time I drive that road at night. Must have been going fast. Devil truck doesn't like speeders. After he said that, I went to look at the tree that I hit and saw a speed limit sign that somebody must have ripped out. It was lying right about the point of impact where the truck had hit me. Speed limit, 45. Sure enough, I was speeding. And I guess the devil truck didn't like it. This happened in Fresno County, November 2015, around 3 o'clock in the morning. I am a medic on an ALS unit, and I was working my normal 1900 shift. I was dispatched to a Code 3 cardiac arrest for a side hanging at around 3 o'clock. The call info only had that the patient was a 34-year-old male hanging and the sheriff and PD were on scene. The location was in the more desolate farm properties in the valley. No street lights, just dark, cold, and engulfed in dense fog during the winter. Rolling up, I see a man dressed head to toe in black. Black shoes, black pants, black long sleeve shirt, black beanie, I mean everything. He was in handcuffs, sitting on his hands, with two officers surrounding him, a female, and two very young kids by the house's front door. There was a broken rope noose on the ground underneath this oddly large, wicked-looking gray skeleton of a tree. The man had a small laceration and a rope burn on his neck, but he was very much alive. When looking at him, his eyes had little of the white and were black. He was quiet until I sat him on the ambulance gurney. The man was sobbing, 
trembling and screaming that he can't take it anymore. As I was putting on our leather restraints on his wrists, I noticed that he had deep horizontal cutting scars along both of his wrists. He was only trembling now, as if he was scared. All I could feel was cold. This man was clearly struggling and decided that night he would give up and end it all, leaving his wife or girlfriend and two children behind. So far, just a sad story, right? Well, this is where it gets freaky. I have never seen anything like this or heard of an experience like this ever before. Three years later, it still gives me the chills every time I think about it. On the way to the hospital, a few good miles down the road, we made a wrong turn, got a little lost and took a back road. He was quiet and trembling. He wasn't fighting the restraints. He almost seemed to feel safer in the back of the ambulance. While I concluded assessing, I got this bone cold shiver down my spine. I looked out the window and saw this house. Mind you, there are acres between every single house out here. Well, this house was like the others. It looked normal, but next to it was this big tree or bush, and in a separate tone and position was this old four-door sedan, parked. The car looked out of place and was clearly separated from the house and the tree and bush. It was like the car was its own place. It was really odd and creepy. I can normally see into the car's cab and see the headrest of the driver's seat from afar, but this car was pitch black on the inside, almost as if the darkness was coming out of the windows because it was the deepest and darkest black I've ever seen. All I saw inside was this deep black and two neon dark blue eyes staring back at me, a little above where a tall and very large man's eyes would be in a car. Immediately I felt the back of the ambulance get colder and there were goosebumps on my skin. At first I thought it was a security light or a reflection in the car. But as we passed the house, the car turned on, pulled out, and started following us in the ambulance. The neon blue eyes were still there, and the cab was still as dark as ever. The car followed us miles to the highway, still with those eyes staring, and the deepest, darkest black in the cab. Even with all the street lights, I could not see into the car. I was almost mystified by this and nearly forgot about my patient. All I knew was that I did not feel welcomed by these dark blue neon eyes. It was almost threatening and felt as if it wanted my patient. We were on the highway and this car was still following us, over 20 miles now. The neon dark eyes were still there and I still couldn't see into the car. It got colder. I started to feel as if it noticed me watching and was watching and focusing on me now instead of my patient. The car then sped up and pulled up next to the ambulance in the next lane while we were driving and looked directly at me. I was very literally five feet from this car and I could see nothing through the windows. All I could see were those eyes. But they weren't looking ahead. They were looking directly at me. In that moment, I said quietly but out loud, go away. You are not touching this man. This man is my patient. And if you want him, you'll have to come through me. I'm stronger than you and I will not let you have him. After I said that, not even a moment later, the car and my ambulance split off. As one went onto one off ramp and the other, I don't know where it went. It was no longer cold in the ambulance and my patient was no longer gray in the cheeks, but now his cheeks were pink and normal. It wasn't until after the call and when we got the patient inside the hospital when I realized what had just happened. I truly feel that 
whatever those deep neon blue eyes belonged to was not human, and that it wanted that man. I've never believed in the paranormal or demons or spirits or anything that wasn't hardcore science until this. I haven't had an encounter like that again, and I hope I never do. I don't know if that man is still alive or what his outcome was, but all I know is what I experienced and saw that night. And it was horrifying. When I was younger, around five or six, I remember having my first paranormal experience. Upstairs we had three bedrooms, one by the stairs and two rooms on the other side that were horizontal to each other, with a bathroom in the middle of them. My room was across the hall from the room by the stairs, so if the door was open, I could see inside of the room from my own. The room across the hall from me also had a dresser with a mirror on it, right as you enter it against the wall. One night I suddenly woke up out of my sleep, and when this happened back then I would leave my bed and go downstairs to my godmother's room, she raised me, to sleep with her. I was sitting up to slide out of the covers and go downstairs when I saw something in the mirror from the room across the hall. It was a man who, now that I think back, reminds me of the portrait that you would see of Jesus. He had shoulder-length brown hair and was wearing a white robe. He was bright, and he also had his hands together, like he was praying. He looked like he was kneeling down beside the bed. I looked at the floor beside my bed and I saw nothing. So I looked in the mirror again and he was still there, beside the bed, praying, but only in the mirror. I couldn't see this man with my own eyes. Only through the mirror could I see him. I was too afraid to bolt for the stairs, so instead I decided to just hide under my covers until morning. My godmother was a Jehovah's Witness, and although I don't know much about that religion, I do know that we didn't have crosses and Bibles around the house. She also wouldn't even let me go to church with her, so it's not like I was force-fed religion. I didn't have much of a reference for that at the time. As a teen, I moved in with my mom and her husband, and I remember seeing my stepdad's mom washing dishes in the kitchen, but only for a few seconds, and then she was gone. That was after I came out of the bathroom where I was washing my hands and getting ready to go back to bed. I happened to glance in the mirror while washing, and she happened to be dead. Do mirrors have anything to do with being able to see things? Why could I only see them in the mirror? I still don't know the answers. I come from a family of pagans and spiritualists, except for my gran who became a strict Catholic. So the paranormal side doesn't really scare me or anything, but this is one incident that will never leave my mind and freaks me out to this day. A few nights prior to this incident, my mother and her friends had a get together at our house not long after we moved in so that it could be cleansed and so on. But before this happened, one of her friends mentioned that something was off about the energy in the house. So, long story short, they got out the Ouija board. This was one thing they all knew how to open and close properly with the right protection. Anyway, my mother said something negative felt like it was in the room. So they proceeded to close the gate that they had opened. Only, that didn't go right in my opinion because the next few days and nights in the house felt really weird. It felt colder in certain spots, and for some reason I really hated the mirror that was in my room, as it just gave off this weird vibe. So fast forward to the night of the incident, and now this same night, I gave up with the mirror and decided to just take it out of my room. It just really creeped me out, and I needed sleep. Well, around 1 to 2 a.m., I'm not 100% sure on the time, I just know it was in that area. 
My mom and I were awoken by this loud sound of glass breaking. So initially, we think someone is breaking in. Both of us take household weapons, just in case we need them, and head to the stairs. This is where I notice the first picture, which is of me and a childhood friend in a frame that was on the wall at the top of the stairway, shattered on the floor. Automatically, I think it's from the force of windows breaking through, so I shrug it off and follow my mother down the stairs into the living room. That's where we turn on the lights, thinking that we could scare the intruder, but no one was there. We look at the windows, thinking that they had already escaped, but we were shocked to notice that the windows were completely intact. Until my mother looks at the floor, broken glass and frames everywhere. And what shocks and freaks me out the most is that when I look at all the picture frames that were broken, every picture had me in them, whether I was alone in them or not. After that night, I really couldn't settle at all in that house. I ended up staying with a family member and eventually my mother decided we had to move. To this day, I will not have mirrors in my rooms, except a small one in the bathroom, and no frames with glass in it, because I'm legitimately worried that this gate will be opened again. It's been 14 years since that night. So far, so good. What is it about mirrors that make them so creepy? I can't figure it out, but I do have a true personal story involving one from my childhood. I grew up in a small town in the Piedmont region of Virginia. Rolling country hills, one high school, everyone was your neighbor, that sort of thing. It was me, my mother, my father, and my brother. And just for the purposes of the story, my brother is six years older than me. Well, my town was pretty small, as I said. So small that my family, my grandmother and her husband, and my great-grandmother and her husband all lived in three separate houses, about a mile apart from each other. Once my great-grandfather died in 1989, my grandma moved in with her mother to help take care of her, as she was getting old in years herself. This didn't bother my grandma, as she and her husband's house was only 500 feet down the gravel road. I don't remember too much about my great granny. I just remember that she was always very grumpy, and that she would always yell at my brother and I when we would go over to her house to play. My brother and I would do this because our house was very small, and our great granny's house was big, an open Cape Cod style house with plenty of room to run around and spread out our toys. When my great granny passed away in the first week of February 1994, it took a toll on my family, because within that same week, my grandfather passed away as well. This means that my grandma lost her mom and her husband, both within about five days' time. I also should mention that my great granny was on hospice care, and she died in the comfort of her home, in her chair surrounded by her family. As I grew on in age, about 8 to 10 years old, I started to retain a better memory about that house, and how honestly creepy it was. The upstairs in particular, as my brother and I were ever really allowed up there. This became especially true since my grandma ended up selling her and her husband's house down the gravel road, and permanently living in this one. And due to the trauma of losing her mother and husband in one week, she developed a pretty bad hoarding habit. Sometimes when my brother and I were visiting, my grandma would be occupied with her Avon downstairs, and we would sneak upstairs to snoop through all the four cluttered rooms. But one room up there always caught my attention. I found myself feeling very lightheaded whenever I would go near it, and sometimes, Feelings of unease or dread would overcome me. It was just your normal room, very small, hardwood floors, and only a twin bed and a small dresser, and a lot of junk. 
like old Christmas boxes, Avon products, and my great granny's worn clothes. But over in the corner of the room, right beside the small crawl-in storage area, was a mirror. I always found myself strangely attracted to this mirror for some reason. It gave me an eerie sort of feeling, one that I can still very much recall to this day. I often caught my brother giving it a strange glance every now and then too. It wasn't until I started seeing this mirror in my dreams that I began to question its history and why my consciousness was showing it to me in my sleeping state of mind. The dreams were very vivid, and as frightening as they were, I never questioned during the dream itself what was happening or why I was there. I sort of felt like I was there for a reason. They all started with me standing on the porch of the house, staring at the door. It was nighttime and quiet all around me with a slight breeze, a very warm and comfortable summer night. The dream progressed with me making my way into the house, except something was a bit off. I was floating, and whenever I would enter a room inside, the door would open for me. All the lights were off inside, but I could still see from the full moon eerily casting its bright light through the open windows, the outside breeze making the curtains dance around inside. Everything seemed to be in slow motion. I make my way upstairs where I'm guided each time to the same room with the mirror. This is the part of the dream where I sense an impending feeling of doom. I make my way in front of the mirror but oddly enough, I never see my reflection. I'm forced to stare at it, when all of a sudden an apparition of my great granny appears. Her skin looks gray and cold, her eyes dark and hollow. The uneasy feeling grows more and more as I start to realize that I am now aware that I'm dreaming. I'm scared to death and I need to wake myself up, somehow. Then, all of a sudden, the image in the mirror turns truly sinister. Her mouth widens, and her eyes glow a deep shade of red, and she lets out the most terrifying scream. This is when I wake up, covered in sweat. I had that exact dream a very many number of times growing up, but I never knew its significance, if there was any at all. I never told anyone, not even my grandma. Fast forward to about four years ago in 2012. My grandma lost her battle to cancer on Mother's Day. My family and I took part in the huge responsibility of cleaning up that house, as we had plans to sell it and move to San Antonio, Texas, where we currently are. The dream had escaped me for some time. I hadn't had it in about 10 years. But when my brother and I, now in our 30s, had the duties of cleaning out that room, the eeriness of it all returned to me. We had a lot of fun times up here, snooping around, didn't we, little brother, he said. I don't remember too much of it, but yeah, fun times, I said. My brother lifts his finger and points. Hey, do you remember that mirror right there? Yeah, I said. It was always really creepy to me, but um, why do you ask? To which he replied, just wondering. I'm not sure if you ever knew, actually, but that mirror was our great granny's favorite mirror from her childhood. And it just so happens that right below that mirror, directly parallel to downstairs, is the chair that our great granny died in. As if that didn't make my skin crawl enough, he pauses for a quick second, smiles, and with a bit of a confused look, he says, You know, for some reason... I used to have the strangest dreams about that mirror. I was an EMT and then a paramedic for eight years before becoming a registered nurse. It was a decent sized city. 100,000 plus citizens, and loads of weird history. I had a lot of things happen, but this is the story that I will never forget. There was one house that we would go to pretty regularly that was beyond haunted. I don't know who or what 
lived and died in there before the then present patient. There were mannequins in the living room, several. I never asked because I didn't want to be in there any longer than necessary. The first time we were called there, I stood on the stoop trying to will my body to go in. The atmosphere in there was intimidating. It almost felt like the house was saying, come in if you dare. My partner was male, so I thought, meh, we'll be fine. I'm a five foot four female and I can hold my own in a bar fight. Threatening presences I cannot see are another story. We get to our patient and as I'm hooking up the EKG, someone backed into me, knocking me off the balls of my feet. I was squatting next to the couch. I tell my partner to back up and he says, from what? I look up and he's on the other side of the room, nowhere near me or the couch. So I turn around. There's nothing there, but I'm eyeballing these mannequins up against the wall, a good 15 to 20 feet away. I shake it off and go back to what I'm doing, and again I'm knocked over. I tell my partner to knock it off, but now he isn't even in the room. He wandered to the kitchen to gather the patient's medications. Now I'm on my feet. There's no way that this happened twice from nothing. I turn back to these mannequins again. One has shifted slightly away from the wall, now standing with a shoulder to it, when before its back was against it. I asked the patient a bit too late if anyone else was in the home. Scene safety should have been first, but yeah, oops. She said no, it was just her and the cat. Thinking this cat must be a puma or something, I start to look for it. Unfortunately, Peanut was no bigger than my American size seven foot. I had only ventured to the hallway, maybe 10 feet from the couch, but out of view of the mannequins. When I walked back into the living room, that mannequin was now facing me. Every hair on my body stood up. Not today, Satan. We packaged her up, got her in the truck for transport and got away from that tiny house. Lo and behold, dispatch sends a request to my tablet for an explanation of a long scene time. I had to put harassed by mannequins in a run ticket without looking like I needed to be on a 72 hour hold. We went back to that house three more times that month. I called from the door for her to come to me. I'm not that stupid. I will never go in there again unless I absolutely have to. My family home is 30-ish years old, and some strange things have happened in it. This happened in 2009, and we still don't have a clear explanation for it. In the house, some slightly strange things happened, like the radio and TV going on and off, and random doors opening. Lots of cracked mirrors and what sounds like voices. But I live in Ireland, and it's quite windy a lot, so I put those things down to that, and the odd surge of electricity or something. The one standout thing is from when my sister was finishing school. I think high school is the equivalent in the US. She's an excellent student, and she wanted to go on to get into a course that's pretty hard to get into for uni, so she was under a bit of pressure. In her room, there was a long mirror hanging in between two windows. The end of her bed came to the end of the window, and there is a section of wall where the mirror hangs, so it's hanging over the floor. The head of the bed is about six-ish feet or more away from the mirror. The mirror was pretty heavy and strung up on cord and hanging on the wall. One night, she was dreaming and in the dream, she saw a woman. As soon as she saw her, she said she felt an evil feeling and immediately knew that she shouldn't have seen her. Then, she woke up to the mirror smashing over her. 
She was screaming so much my parents came running, thinking that something terrible had happened. Her face and arms were cut, and to be honest, she was pretty traumatized. This room is now my bedroom because she's too afraid to sleep in it. My parents couldn't figure out how that mirror came off the wall and broke over her. The cord at the back was undamaged, and the mirror is pretty heavy, so it's unlikely that she would have been able to lift it up off the hook herself and then over her head. Everyone was really freaked out, and we all slept in the same room that night, even my dad, who in no way believes in the supernatural. We spoke about it the next day and agreed not to talk about it outside the family, so people wouldn't keep asking my sister about it. Plus, she was terrified and couldn't really talk about it anyway. To this day, she still can't talk about it, and even writing this and remembering it makes me not want to sleep in my parents' house for a while. About four months after it happened, my sister was doing work experience after her finals with my mom's friend who's a psychologist. She had a local handyman in around her home, which was also where her office is. He met my sister for a few minutes in the kitchen one day when she was taking a break, and then they both went on about their days. Later that night, my mom's friend called to our house to discuss something with my mom. She said the handyman had told her that there was something dark with my sister, that it was a woman the same age as her that couldn't move on and who had come to my sister through a mirror. He said that she needed help. Apparently he sees things but doesn't really talk about it as it freaks him out, but he felt that this was important. My mom immediately asked my dad and I if we had told anybody, and we hadn't. So there's absolutely no way that that man or my mom's friend could have known about what had happened with the mirror. We still have no explanation for what happened, and mirrors in our house are constantly cracking. There isn't a bad energy in the house or anything, but I do have to sleep with a light on at home, and normally I like sleeping in the dark. As a note, a man was pushed in front of a train adjacent to our land, and there was an old woman that lived in a hut thing until she died, after which our house was built and we moved in. I don't know if that has anything to do with what happened. Apart from that, it's a normal house. Back when I was a captain in the fire department, we responded to a house fire early in the morning. When we arrived, the roof was breached and flames had taken out two windows on the second floor of a split-level home. We made entry and even though the roof was breached, the thermocline was about two feet off the first floor. We wouldn't have gone in at all, but a child was missing and the father and mother had gotten out of the house but they couldn't get to their daughter's room. The father was being treated for burns on his hands and forearms as he had tried to go in after her. Suffice to say, they were frantic. They told us that her room was on the second floor, second door to the right. Simple enough. We made entry and the stairs faced the door. Rapid bursts from the TFT to the ceiling brought the smoke level up to about four feet from the floor. That's when my handline man and I saw something that neither of us could explain. I saw motion to my left, down on the main floor. Somebody was walking around downstairs. I pointed to my handline man and he saw it too. We couldn't see a body as the person was in the smoke, but we could see the legs and the feet clearly. It looked to be a man wearing olive green trousers and leather shoes. I wouldn't say that the legs were dancing, but they were certainly moving in a way to get our attention. We redirect back down the stairs and see the legs go into a door on the right side of the small hallway. We both saw the legs go into that room. We get down the hallway and the door is closed. Feeling the door, there weren't flames behind it, so we made entry. 
to discover that we were in a bathroom. The light was on and curled up in the bathtub was the little girl. There was no one else in the room with her. We broke out the window and got her to a second crew, keeping the house next door from catching on fire. We looked around the bathroom again and couldn't find the man that we had both seen going into the bathroom. There was nowhere for him to hide in there. We withdrew from the house and did exposure control as the house was a complete loss with the fire already ingressing into the living room. The parents had gone with their daughter to the hospital where she was checked and cleared to go later that morning. The man had suffered only first and small second degree burns on his hands and forearms. The family stopped by the station and wanted to thank us for saving their daughter. They asked us how we knew to check the first floor bathroom. And I asked them if they knew anything about a man in olive green trousers and leather shoes. The man pulled out his phone after a minute of thinking and showed us a picture of two old men standing on a lawn. One of the men was clearly wearing olive green trousers and those same leather shoes. The man that we had seen on the first floor had passed away in 1976 and it was the man's father. The little girl's grandfather had showed us where she was. We were all speechless. It's the only time that I've ever seen a ghost during a response, but I will never forget it. When this Redditor was traveling through Valley Forge National Park, they decided to pull over to capture the gorgeous moon. What happened next was an experience they've not yet forgotten. Here's the story. Sometime last year, we experienced a unique lunar event. I believe it was called the Super Blood Moon, but whatever it was called, it was absolutely enormous. It lit up the sky, was larger than any moon I had ever seen before, and it was beautiful. During this event, I was traveling through Valley Forge National Park at about 9 o'clock at night. Admiring the moon, I decided I wanted to take a picture of it, if I could do so safely. Fortunately, up on my right, I saw a parking area that still had its gate open. I pulled in so as to be safely out of the road, but only so far. I didn't want to go all the way into the lot for some reason. I stopped my car, exited the vehicle, and pulled out my phone. Kneeling down, I began to set up for my shot. The moon in view, I lifted my finger to take the photo, and stopped. Every hair on the back of my neck was standing on end. Without warning, and seemingly without reason, I felt an intense feeling of dread come over me. I felt as though a crowd of people was pressing in on every side, inching ever closer to me, some close enough to reach out and touch me. I closed my eyes for a moment and then turned around. Nothing. Facing the blackness did nothing to calm my nerves, though. In fact, seeing no visible reason for my fear only intensified it. Something in me felt as though I had pinpointed the source I just couldn't see it. Not wanting to miss my chance to catch a photo of this beautiful moon, though, I turned around to face the camera once more. My hands shook, and I said into the night, I just want to take a picture of the moon, and then I'll be leaving, I promise. After saying this, I felt a slight reprieve in the oppressive feeling, and took two photos. Neither was in focus, though, and at that point, I was so terrified that all I could think of was leaving. Cutting my losses on the shot, I took my phone and tripod, my two blurry photos, and scrambled to get back into the car. Throwing the car in reverse, I got out of that area as fast as I could. To this day, I have never stopped there again at night, and I don't intend to.
One night shift, I was dispatched to the VA clinic. As it turned out, a juvenile was in a psychiatric appointment for hearing voices. The kid reportedly heard a pair of hatchets tell him to cut people. So, of course, the mom brought him to a doctor. During the appointment, the mother grabbed the hatchets from a bag to show the psychiatrist. As soon as she put them in view, the kid grabbed them and ran out of the building and directly into the cemetery across the street. Thankfully, I was not asked to run alongside K-9 to track this kid, but they did find him without any major incidents. I was, however, tasked with bringing the kid to the centers for evaluation, and while he was in the back of my patrol car, we distracted him with questions while another officer very subtly placed the hatchets in my trunk. It was quiet for a while on the way, and all of a sudden the kid said, Sir, you have my hatchets in the trunk, don't you? I can feel them. I didn't verbally respond, but I simply laughed a little. I have never been so freaked out by anything to this day. The centers obviously wouldn't take the hatchets, my sergeant told me not to place them into evidence, and I tried to return them to the mother and she refused to take them. I think we ultimately threw them out, but I don't really know. I just hope they never reunite with that kid ever again. While kayaking on Green River, traveling above Mammoth Cave in Kentucky, these friends would encounter a sound they had never heard before, and one they hoped to never hear again. Here's their story. A few years ago, my friends and I went on a 45-mile, three-night kayaking trip down the Green River in Kentucky, which runs above the Mammoth Cave System, the world's longest known cave system with more than 400 miles of surveyed passageways. We brought everything we needed in our kayaks and one canoe, food, tents, water filtration, etc., and camped each night on the riverbank when it started getting dark, and we found level enough ground most of the time. The first night was uneventful, except to say that there is nothing like a wall of fireflies against a mountainous black tree line at night in the middle of nowhere beautiful. The second day around sunset, after a long day of kayaking and baking in the July heat, we came upon a stream on the bank that opened up into a large ravine. The stream, as we found out, was a cave spring, pouring out blue, freezing cold cave water into a lagoon about 30 feet wide and so deep that the blue water turned black after a few feet. The lagoon had a long, sandy beach, secluded by hills on either side, and a tall, overhanging cliff behind and above us. It was a beautiful, otherworldly place. Time moved very slowly there. We decided to camp there for the night. The sand was soft, white, and very fine, ideal for ground sleeping. For some reason, the place deeply frightened me, but I didn't speak up. We were all tired and everyone was having fun. We built a small fire and enjoyed the stars through the leaf canopy for a while before everybody went to bed. I slept hard that night. At around 5 a.m., I woke up with an urge to relieve myself. It was still dark. I had the tent door zipper about halfway opened and had just popped my head out when I heard a loud and terrible roar or scream. I immediately cowered back into the tent and zipped it closed, and I waited. The scream came from about 10 feet to my left, near the dwindling fire. It was high-pitched, not like an owl's screech, although I'm not ruling that out. It was a wretched, pained scream that got lower pitched toward the end. Being that we were in the middle of nowhere, Kentucky, most likely it was a fox or a boar or some kind of bird. Whatever it was, 
I lay awake for an hour, listening. I heard absolutely nothing. Granted, we were on a soft beach, but I didn't hear a single twig snap or leaf crinkle when whatever it was finally shuffled away. It was bizarre. I should mention at this time that up the beach and off to the side of the lagoon was a small, dry cave opening, maybe three feet wide. I cannot say with any certainty that it was not some ancient, cave-dwelling creature that surfaced to investigate our camp. I somehow fell back asleep and awoke the next morning shaken. I asked if any of my friends had heard the terrible scream, but remarkably, nobody had. We pressed on down the Green River. The third night, at dusk, we came upon a large, rocky beach. We pulled our boats ashore and decided that this would have to do, as we didn't want to go any farther downriver and risk being stuck on the water at dark. This rocky beach was where the river split in two, and, in the middle, formed a collection of pale rocks, tall grass and dried out wood, a desolate pile of muck the size of a football field. The landmass was covered in jumping sand spiders and tiny frogs. Again, otherworldly. We set up camp, ate, and all went to bed around the same time. It was silent for probably 20 or 30 minutes, I'm not sure. I was asleep, as the others most likely were as well. Suddenly, my dream was interrupted by what sounded like a booming, loud, mechanical, wooden beast. I awoke and shot straight up. It was truly the loudest thing I have ever heard. It sounded like a massive bulldozer tearing down a huge steel and wood building. Then came a boom, followed by its echo throughout the river valley. The animals shifted and the birds flew away. We were all awoken by the crash and yelling in confusion to each other in our tents. Nothing but silence followed outside our tents, and nobody was particularly willing to shine a flashlight toward the woods. Eventually, we all decided it had to have been a falling tree, and we went back to sleep. The next morning, I thought about it some more, it didn't sound like just a falling tree. I must stress that it had a metallic quality and it was projected purposefully. It almost sounded like a roar. In the morning light, we found no evidence of anything out of the ordinary, nor any obvious fallen trees that could have made such a loud sound. So we packed up and headed out onto the river one last time to go home. My friends and I still talk about that trip and all the strange things that happened. We did the same kayak trip a couple of years later, and nothing out of the ordinary happened at all. No mysterious forest noises, to both my disappointment and relief. When I was around 11 years old, we lived in a log cabin in the woods of Dedham, Maine. Though there were other houses nearby, we seldom crossed paths with our neighbors. The cabin, which was approximately 250 miles from our primary residence, had been purchased recently by my father, and we had already spent a few nights there. On this occasion, we had planned to stay for an extended weekend. Given the cabin's age, my parents had decided to have some renovations done to enhance its charm. This meant that several rooms were under construction, leaving us with just one bedroom to accommodate all six of us. My parents, my two brothers, my sister, and me. The night had set in, and we were all tucked in the solitary bedroom. Suddenly, in the middle of the night, I was jolted awake by the distinct sound of bootsteps in the living room, an old wooden door on a rickety deadbolt lock, likely to fall apart under a strong impact, were all that separated us from the living room. 
As I was still shaking off the sleep, I heard my sister's voice asking if anyone else could hear the sound. That's when I realized it wasn't a dream. It was all too real. I quickly sat up to find my parents and my sister staring anxiously at the door. My heart started racing, unable to make sense of what was happening. My sister's fear-filled question, are we going to die? sent a chill down my spine. The boot steps paused briefly as my other brother began to wake up, but then they resumed. There was no fading, implying the source of the sound was stationary. A sense of fear and worry pervaded the room as we tried to understand how someone could have entered our locked cabin. As my last brother woke up, the boot steps ceased altogether. In response, my father retrieved the machete he had kept under the bed, cautiously approached the door, and listened for any other sounds. Then, with one swift move, he unlocked the door, flung it open, and brandished his weapon, ready for an intruder. He checked the living room and the other rooms, only to find everything undisturbed. All the doors and windows were still locked and nothing seemed to have been tampered with. Getting back to sleep that night was a struggle. In the morning, the memory of the previous night's events still haunted me. Those crystal clear boot steps were real, a fact confirmed by my family, leading me to believe that we had had a paranormal encounter. Despite our attempts to explain the event rationally, we have yet to find a plausible explanation and one thing I'm sure of, those boot steps originated from inside the house. This remains one of the most frightening experiences of my life. If you have any logical explanation for this, please let us know. My dad grew up in the 70s in a wooded area in Maine. It was a tiny neighborhood with woods surrounding the outer part. My dad had all sorts of unexplained activity in his mother's house, but this is the one that stuck with me. My dad was around nine or 10. He couldn't sleep. Right beside his bed was a window and he could easily look out it from his bed. He heard noises outside, and he got excited because he thought it was a moose or some wild animal, so he whipped open the shade. There was no moose. Looking back at my father was a little boy his age, maybe a little bit younger. He wasn't sure exactly what he was seeing. It was very foggy, but it was undeniable that he was looking at a little boy, a little redhead boy with overalls on, and one of those stupid propeller hats. My dad wanted to close the shade and pretend that he had never seen him, but he just could not look away. The boy smiled and waved and began to walk away, becoming harder for my dad to see. Eventually, the boy disappeared into the fog. It was dark, and there was this thick fog it was easy for my dad to convince himself that he imagined the whole thing. I think little kids find it easier to convince themselves that nothing has happened, that they just have an overactive imagination. I mean, that's what adults always tell children anyway. My dad was over at a friend's house a few days later. They were outside shooting BB guns, normal kids in the 70s, freedom type playing. The friend's dad was working on a car my dad tells his friend this story, thinking that they would both laugh at how silly my dad was. My dad told the friend, but he didn't laugh. His eyes got wide and all the color drained from his face. The friend books it over to his dad. My dad panics a little bit, thinking that his friend was telling his dad that he was trying to scare him and that my dad would get in trouble for it. Instead, 
the boy runs up to his dad and says, Dad, Dad, he saw the boy with the funny hat too. This happened a long time ago, when my daughter was about two. She's now away at college, so I would estimate that this happened in about 2000. I'd been out shopping with my daughter, and she was crying on the way home in the car because she had dropped her sunglasses and couldn't reach them. I couldn't reach them either, and I told her that she would have to wait until we got home. When we got home, I grabbed the glasses from the floor of the car took her out of her car seat, and we went in the house. As I carried her up the stairs, she was playfully trying to fit her little toddler sunglasses onto me. We were being silly and giggling, and I said, let's go see how mommy looks in the mirror with these on. And we went straight to the bathroom to check out my new shades. I turned on the light and held her up to the mirror over the sink. We were just being silly and making faces at each other when suddenly I noticed something in the reflection that should not have been there. As you look into the bathroom mirror with the door open, you could see the entire living room, which would be behind you, reflected in the mirror. My father, who passed away in 1996, so about four years before this even happened, was seated at the end of the sofa, smiling at me. It was like I was frozen, I stood there, looking at him in the mirror, and absolutely couldn't move. I just gaped at him, then looked at my daughter's face in the mirror to see if she had noticed him. She was still too busy grinning and playing with the glasses to notice. I had enough time to get a really good look at him and note what he was wearing, which was rather nondescript. Just an off-white long-sleeved dress shirt, no tie, and dark slacks. Interestingly, this is not how he was dressed when we buried him. He was sitting rather casually, with one leg crossed over the other, and his left arm outstretched along the arm of the sofa. The whole vision, or whatever you want to call it, probably didn't even last 30 seconds, but it seemed like forever. After staring at him in stunned silence, I finally spun around with the baby in my arms to look out the door into the living room and he was gone. My father passed away very suddenly, and I like to think that he came back just to have a peek at the granddaughter that he unfortunately never knew. He certainly seemed to be enjoying the little show we were putting on in the bathroom that day, judging by the grin he had on his face. A week or so after this happened, I was at my mom's house with my daughter, and my mom and I were talking at the kitchen table while my daughter played on the floor. Suddenly, she got up off the floor and walked over to an empty kitchen chair and said, That's Pop Pop's chair. To my knowledge, no one had ever told her that my father had had a favorite chair at the table where he always sat. I said to her, How do you know that that's Pop Pop's chair? She replied, Because he told me when I saw him last night. It made the hair on the back of my neck stand up. Redditor OK Armadillo 3754 went out on a two-week trip through Washington with his girlfriend. They decided not to plan anything and just see where the trip took them. They got a little bit more of the unplanned than they bargained for. This is their story. A couple of years ago, my girlfriend and I decided to take a two-week trip to Washington State. One of the main goals of our trip was to plan virtually nothing. We wanted to take off, let adventure guide us, stop when we saw something cool, and go back home when it was time. So that's what we did. We started out and just made it up as we went along. It was incredible. First we visited Yakima, Washington. Then we traveled over to Seattle, wandered through Olympia, 
explored Bremerton, and eventually made it to Forks. At this point, we decided to go to the Ho Rainforest, which is one of the largest temperate rainforests in the United States. After we'd been there for a while, wandering through in the car, we realized we'd somehow gotten lost. In fact, we were about 20 miles off track, and we ended up in what looked like a tree logging operation. Everywhere we looked, we saw these wide open sections with tree stumps as far as the eye could see. Traveling through this area, the sun began to set. I can't remember exactly what time of day it was when we saw it, but off in the distance, maybe 100 to 125 yards, I saw movement. Whatever it was, it was moving quite fast, and that intrigued me. I slowed down the car and kept my eyes on the figure, trying to see what it was. At first, I thought it was just a bear. Then, as it passed through a cleared area, I realized something that made my hair stand on end. It was running on its hind legs. I watched for about 15 seconds before this thing finally disappeared into the forest. Whatever it was, it was going at least 30 miles per hour on its hind legs, over quite a distance. I have no explanation for what we saw, but whatever it was, it was no bear. I'd like to preface this particular event that happened to me in my youth by saying that I've experienced far more paranormal activity, looking back, than I had ever really taken the time to consider. That being said, I have more stories that I might share in the future, but for this one, I want to tell you about the strange woods of Maine. As a child growing up in the backwoods of Maine, I've heard my fair share of strange things in the night. Typically, it'll be coyotes hunting, or the prowl of another nocturnal creature. As a child, I was never particularly afraid of the dark, but I knew dangers lurked in the absence of light. So at night, I played indoors. During the daytime, however, there were never any restrictions. On one summer afternoon, I was riding my bike down the street that branched off my dead-end road. Our only neighbors were a relative and a couple of decent folks just down the way. Otherwise, quiet woods. I would make this ride quite often, as there was no town, but this stretch was fun to ride because I could pedal my heart out without having to slow down in order to veer. On this day, I made my normal round up the road, only to turn around and head back. I had an uneasy feeling on the ride up, which was the only abnormality. I felt like I was being watched. Something told me to look toward the woods on my right, and reluctantly, I did so. Deep in the woods, amongst the pines, I saw a black, almost liquid thing peer out from behind a tree. My heart dropped. I took off pedaling as fast as my feet would take me, keeping a steady eye on the woods to my right. This thing kept pace effortlessly, darting from tree to tree like some primordial ooze. It was either playing or stalking prey, and I wasn't about to stop and find out which. I was pedaling so hard I thought my chain would snap. I knew my uncle's house was approaching on the left. I spun out in the dirt, ditched the bike, and ran to his door, frantically knocking. I turned around to see if whatever it was would be making its way toward me. But I didn't see anything. My uncle opened the door, cigarette in his mouth, asking me what was wrong. I explained to him what I saw, but he grabbed a rifle and said, Probably just a bear, with slight concern in his voice. I've never seen a bear move like that, I said, out of breath. Yep, he said. They'll do that. He peered through the blinds. To this day, I don't know what I saw, 
but something tells me my uncle sure did. It's been 20 years, and I've since lost contact with my uncle. Maybe someday, I'll reach out and ask. In the summer, my parents rented an Airbnb in Holton, Maine. It was a very old farmhouse, but it was recently renovated. The fields and sunsets were beautiful. I always felt like something was watching me. It wasn't a bad feeling, though. We celebrated my birthday there, and that night I had a crazy dream. A woman named Gladys introduced herself to me and told me that this was her home. She told me she loved having my family and I there. She said that she never wanted us to leave. She also said that our birthdays are very close together as well. In the dream, Gladys and I played a board game and talked about so much. Her past, her family, things like that. I tried so hard not to Google her name and see what came up until after I left to go home. But my curiosity got the best of me. Turns out there was an old woman named Gladys who lived there and died about a year earlier. Her birthday was August 10th, and mine is August 7th. The picture that was in her obituary looked exactly like the woman that I saw in the dream. That's how I know that it was her. I lived in a 1900 farmhouse in northern Maine, along the border of Canada. The house was a small two-story clapboard-sided farmhouse. The central heat was a giant handcrafted metal stove. It was large enough to fit a log a foot in diameter and three feet long, and sat in the middle of the dirt-floored basement. The stove was so airtight that you could throw in several chunks of split hardwood and dog it down tight. Then you crack the air vent just a tiny bit and the fire would smolder all night with heat drifting up through the vents and ducts. It was the main heat source in the house, although there were two additional cast iron wood stoves. I lived there with my father and his girlfriend. My father would spend a lot of time working on the property, clearing brush. He also worked on scraping the peeling paint and applying a fresh new coat. Although he refused to invest money in the house, so many of his repairs were low quality and incomplete. After I moved away, I stayed away for over 15 years. One day, my wife and I were staying at a hotel a few hours away and found ourselves with a free day to randomly explore. We ended up driving back to the area of that house and decided to make it our destination. The area hadn't changed much. The area is very sparse, with a lot of dense trees and large grassy yards and fields, farms here and there. We turned off US Highway 1 onto the road named Wilcox Settlement Road. The house was maybe a quarter mile down that road. The sun was low in the late afternoon sky a bit above the trees. I pulled up at the end of the driveway, or dooryard as the locals call it, and stopped in the road. The house was a wreck, in much worse shape than when my father had owned it. There were a few beat up cars parked by the house. There were barrels and scrap wood and random old junk all around the yard and on the porch. Much of the siding had been removed, exposing mylar backed foam insulation boards that had been pressed between the studs in the exterior wall. There was an old, dented, rusty pickup truck parked closest to the road where we sat idling. My foot on the brake, my wife and I sat gaping at the creepy old dilapidated house. The yard was overgrown and the brush had reclaimed most of what my father had laboriously cleared all those years ago. Movement caught my eye in the dimming light a waving hand. 
there was a man standing on the other side of the old pickup truck, and he was slowly waving his arm, beckoning us toward him. He was a large, overweight man, late thirties to mid forties, dressed in a dirty work coat. His mouth was open in a gap-toothed smile, and he stood there, still, except for his upraised right arm, slowly beckoning us to pull into the driveway. I was frightened. First of all, we didn't see him initially, so it caught us off guard to have him standing as close as he was. Secondly, the way he stood there, watching us, beckoning, reminded me of a scene from a backwoods horror film. The man's smile seemed to me a cunning veneer of harmlessness, belied by a bleary, cold glint of greed, or worse. I instinctively floored the accelerator and sped away. I hate that house. It was a very bad place. I felt like it was stained with bleak sadness, fear, and loneliness. I'm currently visiting York, Maine for a family reunion. We're renting a house about a mile from the Nubble Lighthouse, if anyone cares to look up the location. This house has a wraparound porch with a front door and a side door right before the porch ends and the stairs lead to the backyard. The side door has a very recognizable sound. It almost sounds like somebody passing gas. We joked about it the first night there. The front door creaks like any other old door and slams on the frame. You can hear the wood, then the rubber liner on the door squeeze shut against the frame. Anyway, the first night we got settled in, we all went up to bed around midnight. It's a three-bedroom house with very thin walls. You can hear conversations happening in the kitchen from the upstairs bedrooms, and every floorboard creaks with any movement. My mom and dad went up to bed first, followed by my brother, my girlfriend and I followed about 15 minutes later. The other night, I'm upstairs in my room waiting for my girlfriend to get out of the bathroom. I hear a creak and a slam from downstairs and the vibration through the house of a door hitting the frame. At first I thought it was my dad coming in from a smoke, but I listened and I could hear him snoring in his bedroom. Once my girlfriend got back, I asked her if she dropped anything. She said that she hadn't, but she thought I had fallen off the bed or something because the noise was so loud and shook the house. Kind of creepy, but I didn't think much of it again until last night. Around 12.30 to 1 in the morning, the same door creak and slam noise occurred at roughly the same time. And after this second time, keeping me wide awake, I decided to ask the rest of my family if they were up and about in the middle of the night. My parents deny walking around downstairs, and my brother then tells me he's been sleeping with his light on every night since the very first because he would hear soft footsteps and feel a presence standing at the back of his room. We're going to have a quieter evening tonight and keep an ear to the downstairs area before bed to see if we hear anything else. I'm also considering laying in my brother's room in the dark to see if I hear or feel anything out of the ordinary. If anybody has any experience with this and may know how to stimulate more action, please let me know. I love paranormal things, but up to this point in my life, this is the closest I've ever been to experiencing any. I wish I had more to the story, but this is what we've been going through so far. My wife and I were camping in a campground near Acadia National Forest. 
We realized the last night at the campground that there was an old family cemetery on the property near the tent sites. Later that night, after walking the dogs, we walked in that direction, listening to Necrophonic on earbuds. As we got closer to the cemetery, the app became more active, with fewer pauses between words. It wasn't like the other times that we've had the app running. My wife walked over toward the gravestones to read some dates. While reading the dates, she said, If we're disturbing you, tell us and we'll leave. Then, very clearly, a deeper voice on Necrophonic said, Leave. We apologized and we left the area. The only other experiences that have seemed like there was communication through that app were when we were introduced to the app in Gettysburg by a ghost hunting group. But those experiences were not as clear or direct as that night in Maine. I've always been in tune with the paranormal since I was a little girl. My relatives tell me that I played hide and seek with my great grandfather, two months after his passing. Unbeknownst to me, I was too little to understand death. Besides having contacts with the deceased throughout my life, I've also experienced prophetic dreams multiple times a week, mostly of ordinary events, like dreaming of having a conversation with my mother and then having it play out a couple of weeks later exactly as I dreamed. Some of my other family members also share some particularities. My mother has foreseen pregnancies and cancers, and my cousin always dreams of people before meeting them. I considered all of this somewhat different, but not completely out of the ordinary. I never thought anything of it except having the constant deja vu passing through me like a shockwave from events that play out exactly like in my dreams. Until one day, it all changed. And before I start, I would just like to say that this story is 100% true, and to this day, I don't know the complete truth behind it. In September of 2018, I saw a moth. Nothing unusual, just a regular moth that landed on my desk while I was studying for university. It was the most ordinary moth you could imagine, and I thought nothing of it. Until three days later, when I saw another one. Again, a regular moth with no distinguishable features just happened to enter my room and stay on the wall. And then again, a couple days later, I saw another one land close to me at the university. I would be walking on the street and see moths everywhere. Before September of 2018, I had seen maybe five moths in my entire life. And then all of a sudden, I saw five in one week. If it was only happening in my bedroom, I would assume something logical was going on. But they always seemed to follow me everywhere and land close to me, even at random places like the DMV. After a month of this madness, I had a random conversation with my grandmother about something completely unrelated. That's when she mentioned that her deceased mother-in-law, my great-grandmother, was a witch. Not a regular witch, but black magic type of witch. Now, my grandmother is not completely trustworthy since she does exaggerate absolutely everything she says. It could very well have been that she just had some incense and candles and my grandmother said she was sacrificing chickens to the devil or something. I was never able to figure out the truth of it since nobody in my family speaks of it. And the one person that does is not a completely reliable witness. But true or not, I started looking into witchcraft and paganism after this conversation and I came across the symbolism of moths. One of them is spiritual transformation. And then it clicked in my head that maybe, just maybe, someone was trying to reach out to me, to guide me, to get me to research, to tell me that this is what my spiritual path is supposed to be. Maybe it was my great-grandmother trying to hold my hand and steer me in the right direction. Maybe you believe this and maybe you don't. 
All I know is that after this realization, the moths stopped. I went back to seeing them on a normal, regular basis. And when I do, I always greet them like old friends, and I thank them for the message. I'm a strong believer in listening to my gut. I always have been and always will be, since it's gotten me out of a few situations. One was my freshman year of high school. School had ended for the day, and since I was staying at my dad's house that week, I decided I would walk home. His house wasn't that far from school. Everything was fine, until I turned down the street where there's a shortcut. It led straight into my neighborhood. As I was walking to the shortcut, a man drove by, staring at me. My stomach dropped and turned. I took this as a note to walk a bit faster. By the time I got into my neighborhood, the man was circling around the cul-de-sac, waiting for me. He had a smirk slowly creeping onto his face as I walked by his car. I tried to ignore him the best I could and just kept walking. He would drive past me and yell vulgar things at me. He kept turning around and driving past me again and again. As I turned down my street, he followed closely behind. I saw him drive down my street and turn into someone's driveway to turn back around. I quickly got into my house and locked the door behind me. I then turned around to look through the peephole so I could see if he left. He didn't. The man pulled up into my driveway and got out of the car. Luckily, my neighbor, who's a family friend, was out in his garage. He came over yelling at the man and then stayed with me until my dad got home. A week later, my dad told me he saw the man parked at the end of the street, waiting for me. He went and threatened the man and we haven't seen him since, but I'm still freaked out every time I go and visit my dad. It's safe to say, I won't be walking home alone ever again. It was Christmas Eve of 2014 at about 8 o'clock p.m. I was driving to my boss's house to drop off a set of keys when an orange orb flew over my car. I immediately pulled over to the side and got out of the car and looked up to see a dozen orange orbs the size of cantaloupes. They were five to 10 feet above me. They seemed to have heartbeats and would control their brightness, pulsing. I was trying to see if they were solid, but they weren't which was odd because they were definitely intelligent. They were completely silent and seemed to have their own personalities. Some stood still while others whizzed by playfully. When I would stare at one, it would blink, I guess to let me know that it saw me. I wasn't scared. I was actually euphoric and very excited to be a witness to this. They seemed friendly to me. I watched them for about three to five minutes until they slowly flew away and each one disappeared. I was amazed and I even stopped at a church that was close by to ask if anybody had seen these things. They said no. To this day, it was one of the most bizarre and profound experiences of my life. Also, the next day, my eyes were burning red and sore. I later found out that there were many other sightings all over the U.S. on the same night. A few friends of mine were into exploring abandoned places and checking locations out. Whether it's a rundown shack in the middle of nowhere or an abandoned building, we were always eager to take a look around. To be clear, 
We don't vandalize or destroy property. We just go take a look. One day, I find out that one of the cemeteries in my area is apparently haunted. It borders on an old abandoned mental hospital, and the cemetery was the burial ground for some of the unfortunates who died at that place. The asylum is 150 years old, and it was a horrible place for those who were housed there. All up, there were four of us. After 20 minutes of driving, we get out and search for this cemetery. After about 10 to 15 minutes of looking on maps and walking up and down the neighborhood, we finally came across the cemetery's entrance. It was around 11 p.m. when we got to the cemetery. It was very quiet, barely any cars on the street, and all I could hear was the distant dogs yapping about. All four of us start heading into the cemetery. We're taking this slow and using our eyes and ears to catch anything suspicious. As we're walking, I hear a faint laugh coming from the trees below. It sounded like a child. I first wrote it off as a dog barking in the distance or just something explainable. As we continue down the track farther, I hear the child laughter again. I turn to my friend, who turns to me, and we both just stare at each other. We both heard the same thing coming from the woods below and were just spooked. But that didn't stop us. We pushed on, going farther into the cemetery and toward the trees. We eventually ended up getting too scared and decided to turn around and walk back. I was positioned with another friend of mine, about two meters behind my other buddies. All of a sudden, I can hear heavy footsteps walking toward us to our right. I'm not kidding when I say this. These footsteps just started picking up pace and we could hear these loud thumping steps just galloping at us. We panicked like crazy because we were looking directly toward this sound and nobody was there. It was too loud to be some kind of critter and it definitely wasn't another person. I'm older now and I no longer explore urban places or abandoned places. It's too risky and I don't want to get fined, but I still can't find the logical explanation for whatever it was that we experienced that night. This happened back in 2019, around November 2nd if I remember correctly. This story is 100% true, although I'm still unsure if it was just a coincidence or what. But anyway, this is what happened. Back in 2019, I was pretty much depressed the whole year. I wasn't planning on doing anything, I just didn't care as much about my well-being. I stopped wearing a seatbelt. I didn't care if I lived or died. It wasn't that I wanted to do either, I just was apathetic. Due to this depression and things getting worse for me mentally at the time, I did a lot of really dumb things in the supernatural realm. I've always known not to speak to the dead, knowing that when you speak to one spirit, the rest can hear you as well. I've always been extremely superstitious, and I believe in the paranormal and supernatural a thousand percent. Anyway, I live next to a huge cemetery and I drive by it every day since it's right across from my neighborhood. Due to my superstitions and believing that the dead can do things us humans aren't quite capable of, each day I would scream out of the window when passing the cemetery, begging one of the spirits to, shall we say, bring me to their side. This habit started on November 2nd, I believe. So I did that each day while driving past the cemetery. Lo and behold, on November 6, I was driving to work at about 4.30 in the morning. I go the same way every single day. I was coming up on a red light. Out of nowhere, and I kid you not, this was literally out of nowhere. I hear this loud honk from behind me, and I was rear-ended by one of those big white RG&E trucks. You know the ones that fix telephone poles and stuff? 
Since I was at the red light, it basically pushed my car forward into the middle of the intersection. And once again out of nowhere, I was T-boned by some random man in a van with his wife. I was driving an 05 Nissan Sentra at the time, and it was completely wrecked. Literally demolished. But I had not one scratch on me at all. My knees were extremely bruised. I have no idea how that happened, but that was pretty much it. This also happened literally on the main road coming out of my neighborhood, about a mile down from the cemetery. And there are never cars this early in the morning. Maybe one, but even that's rare for the most part. While I was talking to the old man, they live in a town 40 minutes away, and they were driving to the park at 4.30 in the morning? The whole story is so weird, and it honestly kind of creeps me out, especially because one of the things I kept yelling was to get me in a car accident. It was an extremely bad financial situation for me at the time, and I was stuck without a car for quite some time. I think perhaps the cemetery or the spirits within it were maybe giving me what I asked for, but not what I asked for. Maybe they just wanted to wake me up and help me appreciate life again. Or maybe it was just a completely weird coincidence. Take it for what you will, but it was an extremely weird thing. While on vacation in Japan last year, I stayed at an Airbnb near the Daigo Shrine in Kyoto. On my last night in town, I came back to my Airbnb at about 11.40 p.m. on a Monday night. Mind you, I had no alcohol or drugs in my system when this happened, and I was wide awake. There's a shrine that you have to walk past on a walkway that goes to and from the Airbnb to other areas of town. It was three city blocks long by two blocks going both sides. As the layout goes, there were ditches at the foot of the walls, followed by a row of plants alternating all the way down, and then there was a walkway in the middle, with a museum on the right, a whole shrine and palace at the fork. I walk into the walkway of the shrine and I ask myself this question, why are there two kids hopping a wall? As I see these two little figures hop the wall to my right, I pause and watch what's happening. As they both get down, they run across the path and run all the way to the end of the path by the fork and wait there. I was walking single file. They stand there for a few minutes. I walk a little closer because that was the way to the Airbnb and I make eye contact with these things. They were about three to four feet tall, very slim but proportionate with a bigger head and pointed ears as white as snow. Their eyes were as big as our eye sockets, but black. Normally you can tell if someone is wearing clothes at a small distance. I was maybe 15 to 20 yards from them, but they had no sign of clothing. After making eye contact, both of them go running around the corner that I had to turn. You could also see their shadows on the walls behind them. But I slowed down to give these things space. I was freaking out a little bit at this point. As I turned the corner, they were gone. I'm walking back to my Airbnb and I sensed that I was being followed, but I couldn't hear or see anything. I have no idea what I saw. Aliens? Something else? I don't know. I just got back from a visit to Gettysburg in Pennsylvania. I stayed at the Best Western next to Cemetery Ridge. My room actually looked out onto the ridge. On the first night, I woke up at about five in the morning and I looked out the window at the hill. It was a clear night without a moon, so the hill was completely dark. All I could see was the outline of the ridge. 
I stared at the ridge and tree line for about two minutes, not really knowing what I was looking for, and just thinking about the battle there. For some reason, I started thinking about what if I saw a ghost or an orb, and at that very moment, a bright round white ball of light came in the tree line at the ridge of the hill. It didn't look like a flashlight since it didn't have a beam or variate in any way as it moved. It was about the size of a softball, I imagine, since it was about 150 yards away. It started moving right to left along the tree line, and then sped off across the hill toward the angle. If you know that location on Cemetery Ridge, then you'll know what I mean. The whole thing lasted about 30 to 45 seconds, and as it was happening, I wanted to run over and grab my phone to take a picture or a video, but I didn't want to miss anything. I was also trying to figure out what it was. Once it was gone, there was nothing and nobody on the ridge from what I could see. So I got my phone and recorded for about 10 minutes while watching to see if it came back. Unfortunately, nothing appeared and daylight was starting to break. So I could actually start making out the trees and a few statues and monuments on the ridge. Needless to say, I couldn't get back to sleep. I feel like I should also add that the movement of light from right to left was erratic and when it sped off, it was extremely fast, leaving a trace of light behind it. In my opinion, nobody could have run that fast, and there was no indication of a motorcycle or a bike or a car anywhere nearby. So, I don't know, but it was cool nonetheless. This is the story of Madeline, the doll that has my face. For context, my mom is the original owner of Madeline, but Madeline has been mine since I was a child. Madeline was bought by my mother about 35 years ago, long before I was born. There's a possibility that she's a lot older than that, as she was secondhand when my mom bought her. These are my experiences with this doll. I'm well aware that creepy doll is a trope, but stay with me. Madeline, I named her, is a porcelain doll with a soft body filled of horse hair with her hands and feet and face made of plain white porcelain. Her hair, according to a doll expert I had her repaired by a few years ago, is a combination of horse and human. She's about 30 centimeters long with brown hair, blue eyes, wears a blue cotton dress with embellishments, black leather lace-up boots, and a somewhat Victorian underdress. I believe she was pretty common, a generic doll type. I base this off the fact that I took her to doll shows as a child to find out a little bit more about her, since she doesn't have any marks. And another lady had her almost exact identical replica. Same dress, same colors, hair, and everything. So she must have been pretty common. The only difference? The face. The lady and I compared the dolls, vividly pointing out how my doll's face was almost identical to mine. I'm not saying it's impossible to have dolls who look somewhat similar to you. I mean, that's just good marketing, really. But at the time, I had a jaw problem that required surgery, and the doll's jaw perfectly matched mine. Heavy overbite. This lady's doll didn't at all. Given the dolls had everything else exactly the same except the face, it just sort of makes me wonder if at some point her face had been replaced or repainted before my mom purchased her. I don't believe Madeline to be a harmful entity, but a few strange things have happened that make me wonder. As a child, I kept her on my bed on the top bunk. I had one of those loft beds with a desk under it while I was at school. If someone was to change the sheets, they'd put her back because mom was always worried that the dog would eat her. She was always on my bed and I was the only kid in the house, so I'm the only one who played with her at the time. At school one day, I would have been about 10 years old, I broke my right wrist 
Most children will break something in childhood, and I had fallen out of a tree. I remember getting home from the hospital at about 8 p.m., and I was a bit dopey from the assistance they'd given me. Because I couldn't climb the bunk in a cast, Mom made me up the mattress on the ground. I had grabbed Madeline so that Mom could move the bed, when suddenly, Madeline's right hand dropped onto the carpet. I would brush this off, but more has happened. Once I needed stitches in my head. I came home and there was a chunk of Madeline's hair gone. I had jaw correction surgery. Now neither of us have an overbite. I've had knee surgery and have a scar on my right foot. And she has just had a crack repaired on her right foot. Mom, who hadn't seen her in a few years as I've had things in storage, recently made a comment, and it's what made me decide to tell my story. She said, I remember her having a much younger looking face when you were little. Could this doll be aging with me, experiencing things like I am? I really don't know what it means, but I'm interested to hear your thoughts. So the other night, my boyfriend, daughter, who's three and a half, and I were walking in the cemetery a few blocks from our house. We drove because we wanted maximum walking time with the toddler. We planned to play Pokemon Go. We entered through the main entrance, and after a few steps, I started feeling nauseous and worried. Anxious. I didn't know why, so I just ignored it. We wanted to check out the huge headstones toward the middle, so we headed that way. We noticed a car parked with its lights off, no front license plate, passenger and back doors wide open, and the man is halfway in the back seat. He's parked on one side of the big headstones, which ended up being priests. We walked through and the guy noticed us. He closed the doors that were open then went around to the driver's side and got in the car. He sat there and just watched us. So we veered away from him and went down a different path. My daughter all of a sudden says, They're so loud. I said, Who? My daughter goes, The rocks. They're talking to me. My mouth drops open. We didn't tell her anything about the cemetery or headstones or what the place even is. She has no idea what they are other than big rocks. We ended up leaving, and as soon as we drove away, my nausea eased up. I told my boyfriend about feeling sick, and he freaked out and explained EMF to me. Creepy. We went to the store and passed the cemetery on the way home again. The man's car was still there. He left after we pulled down the street that we lived on. We've had one other paranormal experience with her before. This was the second time that the afterlife, ghosts, spirits, something, showed up to say that it exists, and it's confirmed for me. Later that night, she started talking about the rocks again and said that they were watching us. I asked her what they looked like, and she said, shadows. She said they looked like this, and then proceeded to make a worried expression. She told me that they couldn't walk with us and that they had to stay by the rocks. I don't know if the spirits were warning us about that man, or maybe there's just something not so good at that cemetery. But either way, it was a really interesting experience. My name is Josh and I am 26 years old. I was an only child and I didn't have very many friends, so I spent a lot of time alone. When I was about 11, 
I moved in with my grandparents. They lived in a small town, pretty rural, and I spent most of my days, especially on the weekends, outside walking around. There was an old cemetery within walking distance of my grandparents' house that had graves dating back all the way to the late 1600s in the oldest section. The newest graves were no younger than the late 90s and early 2000s. It was pretty run down, since the newest graves, like I said, were in the 90s and 2000s. The oldest section was even more run down. I felt bad that these people were seemingly just forgotten, and nobody ever visited them. My grandma owned a flower shop, and she had a bunch of excess flowers. So I asked her if I could take some to put on some of the graves in the cemetery. She agreed, and I took about four bags full and walked to the cemetery. I got there and started walking around, putting flowers on all the graves. I went through the newest section, putting flowers on the graves without incident. I had gotten through about four graves in the oldest section, when something just told me to look up. I looked up and saw a woman, just standing there, directly behind the grave that I had just put flowers on. She was smiling at me, and she seemed to be so happy. I stood face to face with her for about a minute, and then she disappeared. Then I went on putting flowers on the rest of the graves, and I left. I think maybe she was just happy that somebody was coming to visit. I don't know, but it was really special. So I'm walking to my new job at FedEx, and I didn't realize that I had to walk past a cemetery. Mind you, my shift is from 4 a.m. to 9 a.m. I've walked past many cemeteries in my life, so I wasn't too concerned at first. I had a pretty lit up highway on my left, and on my right was a large cemetery. No cars, no people, just me. As I kept walking, I start feeling uneasy about the vibes. It wasn't fear, nor was I scared, but it was dreadfulness and sadness overall. And to make matters worse, I didn't realize that it was 3 a.m. at the time. I tried to look straight ahead and not acknowledge the fact that I had a cemetery six feet away from me, just engulfed in complete darkness. But I couldn't. And I can't explain really what I felt, but it was just awful, like a heavy feeling of sadness, but it felt cold. After walking for 20 straight minutes and realizing I had another 15 to go, I decided to just go back home. As I started walking back, I started hearing the grass rustling, as if somebody was following me. Honestly, I think my mind was playing tricks, but the whole time, I felt like I was being watched. I've had a good amount of paranormal encounters in my life, so I'm familiar with this feeling, but I just felt so afraid at that point. I just wanted to share this experience because it kind of had me distressed, and I'm just curious to see if anybody else has had a similar experience. When I was about seven years old, my mom was at work and my dad was watching me. I was an only child and I didn't have any friends over at the time. I'm pretty sure my dad and I were playing with Barbies when we both heard two children laughing. Nothing malicious, just playful. Then, all of a sudden, we hear a loud thud coming from my bedroom. Naturally, my dad and I went to go check it out all of the stuffed animals that I had on the bottom bunk were on the floor. I had a bunk bed, but the entire twin mattress wall was filled to the brim with stuffed animals. Every one was on the floor. Nothing could explain how they had fallen, other than perhaps the children we heard laughing seconds before had pushed them off. 
I had many experiences with the paranormal. We did live close to a funeral home and a cemetery, and this was just one of many things that happened when we lived there, but it's still one of my favorite stories. Marine Lights by Anonymous. Some context. I'm a marine biologist, and a good portion of my research involves tagging and monitoring deep sea creatures. Last month, we were in the middle of the Atlantic, quite far from any landmass or shipping lanes. The event occurred on a particularly calm and clear night. The water was like glass, reflecting the stars and the only sounds were the occasional creak of the ship and distant calls of seabirds. Around midnight, as I was making some notes in the lab, I began to feel a low frequency vibration, almost like a hum. Curious, I went up on deck, and that's when I saw them. Far off in the distance were lights dancing just above the water's surface blues, purples, and golds weaving in and out in patterns that seemed deliberate and intelligent. I initially thought they were reflections of some distant ship or aircraft, but the patterns were unlike any man-made lights I'd ever seen. And then came the voices, whispers that seemed to originate from the water itself, soft murmurs rising and falling like a distant conversation carried by the wind. I strained to understand, but the language, if it even was one, was unlike anything I had ever heard. The display went on for what felt like hours, but must have been only minutes. I tried to record the phenomenon, but all of my devices malfunctioned. Cameras, phones, everything. As suddenly as they had appeared, the lights vanished, leaving behind the vast dark ocean and the twinkling stars. The hum and the voices faded, replaced by the usual sounds of the night. When I shared my experience with the crew the next morning, one of the older sailors, a native of the nearby islands, mentioned legends of ocean spirits that sometimes communicated with or showed themselves to humans. These tales had been passed down in his family, and though he had never witnessed it himself, he believed my story. I'm still trying to find a scientific explanation for what I saw and heard that night. Bioluminescent organisms, some sort of underwater seismic activity, or maybe something truly paranormal. Paranormal. 